And we are live. Hey, everybody. I'm waiting here to mute this thing as soon as it starts. There we go. Okay, good. Uh, we got Brother and Dave. we are live. Hold on. Hey, See, everybody. I tried to mute it. It didn't work. I'm waiting here to <laughs> See, I tried. It still didn't work. Okay. Uh, we got Brother Dave and Brother Luke from Sin City Preacher here. And I have posted, and I'll put it up there, Luke, or one of us will, periodically through the chat room. So if anybody wants to join the panel or just to hang out and talk and fellowship or wants to share something or whatever, that you can come up here and join us uh, because this is a fellowship. It's not uh, necessarily a teaching or a study, although it can go there. It just depends on where the participants want to go in conversation and uh, what the chat room has to say. You know, if there's questions or praise reports or whatever subject you guys want to discuss, this is for all of us as the body of Christ. And I, I just wanted to reiterate something Sister Paula said in uh, Luke's video interview with her that uh, we are all one in Christ and there's none of us above another. I'm not above anybody. Luke isn't. Just because, Brother Day, all of us, just because we preach the gospel or we have a little bit of knowledge about scripture, we're not above anyone. We are we are all one and all equal in Christ. So um, with that being said, uh, you guys want to say hello? Uh, go ahead, Brother Luke. Okay. Well, uh, I'm... I hope that everybody hears me very well because I just spent, spent a small fortune on the microphone yesterday. Um, people have kept telling me that, well, uh, the audio is good for Renee and Crips, and, but your audio, can you turn the volume up? And my, my, I talked to Matthias about yesterday. He says, no, you, you just have that little old fashioned stick microphone that's 20 years outdated and you need to get a microphone, a real good one. So he told me what to get, and I went and bought it yesterday. So I hope I sound good today. <laughs> Let me know how it sounds. Uh, happy to be here. Some of you probably surprised because uh, usually we have this Fellowship Friday on my channel, but I wanted to do it on Renee's channel. She's, she's eager to have these hangouts, and uh, I think we ought to do it as much as possible on Renee's channel. So let's all have a great time together tonight, praising Jesus and uh, fellowshipping with the saints. Look, we got Sister Paula just joined us and Caleb. Awesome. Hello. And Yay, we're... Paula made it. Yeah. <laughs> What's up, girl? Paula, we I'm... I'm glad you're able to join us. Uh, yeah, I... now, that, I... now that now that Paula's here, uh, I'm going to attempt to flatter her. Beware <laughs> of the flatterers. Okay. <laughs> I don't I didn't say the flat earthers. I said the flat earth, <laughs> the one who is flattering. <laughs> uh, That's funny. I, uh, I got to know uh, Sister Paula very well last night. I from from her birth to present time, I went through scrutinize her entire life, and I will tell you, I am very very impressed. I was impressed impressed before the I did the interview, but even more so now. And then last night, I following the interview with Paula. Um, I went to her channel and I was particularly curious about a, uh, her book and her teaching on women's uh, place in the world and in the church. And so I watched her uh, video on that, on that subject. Uh, it was three and a half hours long. I, w I wanted to watch it all last night, but I couldn't stay up that late. So I finished it today and it is really awesome. Uh, I urge everybody to go to her channel. Uh, what was the name of that one or us, we are uh, no. We, we, you are one. You are one. Yeah. Uh, but that's the name of the playlist. But the name of the video has a different title. Uh, going there, women in the world and church, something like that. But it starts yeah. with going there. Yeah, it's three. It's three and a half hours long. So you may have to watch it in segments. But uh, she starts off talking about prominent women in history, and then she goes through the prominent women in the Old Testament and then in the New Testament. And uh, I think that uh, if, if, you'll, if you will watch that in its entirety and open up your minds, because I know one of the biggest problems in Christians I've known is that they're very narrow-minded. Unfortunately, this, this stereotype of 
Christians being narrow-minded is proven to be true. <laughs> but they, uh, we get dogmas, and we don't want to change our mind, but you need to open up your mind because there's a chance you might be wrong about something. So listen carefully and consider her teachings on this subject, and I think you'll be blown away if you open up your mind. Thank you. Hey, Brother Luke. Except me. I'm, I'm never wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Brother Dave. I said, I said I'll, I'll open up my mind, but I don't. I was, I was going to say, uh, are you sure we shouldn't be opening up our third eye? Uh, don't open your mind too much. It might fall out. Ah! There's, there's no, no, I was just I was just making a joke because there's it's so funny. I've been I've been running into these forums lately where uh people are like, Yeah, we're Christian, we have our third eye open, and, and I'm just like, Oh no, what is going on? Yeah, it's scary when the new age and Hinduism is coming into what Christendom thinks it is. Yeah, I'm I'm Christian maybe. using words like karma and third eye and uh, May, May in the chat room says, uh, Sensei Preacher, I can finally hear you. Ha <laughs> ha, awesome. My microphone is actually working now. It All actually right. sounds really good, Brother Luke. It sounds loud and clear. Yeah, great. Hey, hey Caleb, do you want to say hi? Hey. Speaking of new age and stuff, I'm writing a comic about it called Wickedness in High Places. Wow. Um, I'm in the process of writing it right now. I don't have the technology to draw the novel or comic, but yeah, pretty soon I will have it. That's fantastic. That can uh, reach uh, people your age, and it'll be a nice genre uh, to do it through. That's fantastic. The story is there's three teenagers, Tabitha, John, and Jack. Two of them are saved, and one of them is not, and one of them has been introduced by a girl named Beth into the space movement, and she's now introduced. She has she's meditated for the first time, and she's been introduced to a spirit god named Nagata. And Nagata is filling all these lies up in her head, and she's believing them. And slowly but surely, but eventually, she will be possessed. Yeah, uh, Shirley McLean is a good example. Shirley McLean is a good example that listens to uh, these lying spirits, these ascended masters so long that she actually has a hatred for the true faith and believes that we are gods ourselves. If you saw yeah. out on a limb, that was her story. That you know, Television has no problem putting some new age revelation and lies up there. They don't put the true biblical gospel. They'll put some Catholic garbage up there too, but they won't put the true gospel that Jesus is the only way. But they'll be, they'll be glad to promote new age Hinduism, even Islam watered down for the West. Yeah. You know, instead of the real Islam that tells that Christians and uh, Jews need to be slaughtered um it's uh it's all really wicked it's a lot of humanism sis and they um yeah. yep. what they do is they they come up with this story of how we're born uh god is the universe and the earth and the energy uh -huh. and the spirit that's within us all there's a there's a divineness within us all and we just have to discover it mm -hmm. and they 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 make it they paint a picture to where it's very similar to the Bible where they say, you know, we should walk in kindness and love and forgiveness and all the things. And it's that they, it's like they create this humanistic story, but it's, but it also includes like not submitting to God's will in any way. It's you're right. your own God. And you know, the Bible has some good stuff in it, but our way is the, is the real enlightenment. Well, Satan's got to add a little bit of truth to make his false light attractive. Yeah. And that's what and that's another element that I put in my comic with this being not called Nagata. There's three demons that are after Tabitha. One of them is named Nagata. Well, that's the name of one of the form it's took in. And then the other two comes in the form of Mike <coughs> one, one form of Michael the Archangel and the last one comes as Jesus. And eventually she opens herself up to where she got to the highest level of the chakras and she, becomes, she will become possessed for a short time. Wow. That would yeah. be a uh, really cool story because yeah. right now the occult is being, uh, and there's nothing new about New Age. It's ancient yeah. wisdom. 
Um, but yep. it, it's really being promoted to the youth right now. And, uh, you know, of course people are drawn to something that tells you you're good. Inherently, you're a good person. You don't need God and you're, you're not going to pay for the things that you did wrong. That'll just be swept under a rug or you'll just keep evolving and learning from your mistakes. Of course they yeah. want to hear that. Yeah. Divine energy doesn't die and you'll come back and get it right. And mm -hmm. there's no such thing as sin. There's no heaven, no hell, no right. Jesus. Yeah. You know, yeah. When I was reading conversations with God years ago and I was in such a bad state, I wanted it to be true. I want it. This is why I believe I, I could have I could have been saved as a child and really just backslid. Although I, I can't know. And like I said, I'm not going to argue about when I got saved. All I know is about 13 years ago, I got strong in my faith. But uh, back then I was reading that book and I really wanted it to be true. I mean, I wanted to believe it, but I'm telling you. It was so loud in my spirit. It was, I've heard it a couple of times in my life where it's an inaudible voice, but it's so loud and it's coming from outside myself. I'm not hearing it with my real ears, but spiritually I'm hearing it so loud. It's like someone's yelling behind me. The same voice I heard when I said, am I supposed <laughs> to be seminary? Because I, I knew God was going to use me. And he, I heard no. And then I approached him again and I said, well, you don't want me, you don't, want me to serve you don't want me to use to preach or teach anything i've learned i didn't hear that what i heard is don't go to seminary he did want to use me but i think i would have learned error in the seminary i think god was going to teach me himself but that same night i was reading it i heard god's voice say this is not me because the book claims to have automatic writing and I didn't know any better that back then. I didn't have the discernment. But uh, I really wanted to believe it. He's love. There is no hell. I would never send anybody. To, you know, that kind of thing. And I heard him loud and clear say, this is not my voice. I did not speak to this man. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I wanted to believe it. So I know that God speaks to his children. Whether I was his or not, he knew I would be his. And he was right. taking me from that. Renee, you uh, you were there on Wednesday night when I started hearing voices, right? Yes, it sounded strangely like Matthias. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm hearing voices, but no, but uh, the audience couldn't hear it because he had his uh, public microphone muted, and he was <laughs> able to communicate with me. So I'm responding to him, and people were thinking I was crazy because I'm talking to someone that they don't understand, but. Matthias is behind the scenes producing the program, but uh, I've never heard the audible voice of God. I don't know. There's there's some people that actually, actually have told me that they heard an audible voice from God. Uh, I but, haven't yet. Yeah. Eventually hmm. I will, but I haven't yet. Yeah. Yeah, eventually we all will. But uh, hey, uh, uh, You guys, a viewer... Ask for some advice. Hold on, let me see. Is it Scott? Hold on one second. Let me see. I don't want to get this wrong. Somebody says, hey, I'm having a hard time being in fellowship. All right, Chad. That's who it is. Chad says, I'm struggling with my relationship with God. I need advice, please. One, I would say, you guys go ahead, but I was going to say, trust him. That's it. Trust him. Right. Know his character, how good he is and how much he loves you and what he's done for you. And if you don't have that revelation of the fullness of that yet, you need to keep studying scripture and ask him to reveal that to you. But you need to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's where you begin. Trusting God based on his, the goodness of his character is where you can begin. You talk to people that you know. You listen to people that you know, and it is a relationship once you're saved. So that, that's my advice. Go ahead, you guys. Uh, I want everybody to see this here. Can you see, can you see this? Um, I'm well, all in. <laughs> Renee, uh, Renee, why is I'm not seeing this in my screen here? Are you're, I, I, if you have your picture, uh, now we got Caleb on there. Can you see it? Yeah. Everybody see this? I'm not seeing it show up on my on the screen there, but it says I'm all in. Yep, uh, King of Kings. What director is it? King of Kings. It's all it's four kings. 
I'm all in, King, King of Kings. But it's an expression in, in Las Vegas in the gambling uh, business. So being all in means you, you're betting everything you have on this one hand. And uh, that's, that's what we need to do is uh, we need to put all of our faith in Jesus. As soon as we hold back even a little bit and, and divide our faith, then it's, it's worthless. That's a, yep. I like that. I like the design. Hmm. What do you say to uh, uh, Chad, Brother Dave? Well, I mean, it's, you know, it's, I know it's difficult to get to that place where, where you can trust and, and believe it because, you know, everything in our natural self just wants to, it's, it's hard to believe it because we've been ingrained to feel like we're good enough or we deserve it. And it's, it's really hard to wrap our mind around. Um, and I know we all go through it at a point in time where it's like, no, it can't, we can't, it can't just be believing. It can't just be trusting. We have to do something. And, you know, I guess the more you kind of just experience with that thinking, the more you fall down, the more you realize that, that he's going to just turn you around until you're completely dependent upon him. And, I don't know. It's like throwing all your, like Luke said, he's all in. You just put all your eggs in the basket of Christ and you say, all right, I'm trusting you. I, I believe you are who you say you are. I believe that you died, was buried and rose again for me and just going to take it one day at a time here, trust in you and just teach me, guide me, seek God for wisdom. He says that if we seek him, he will show us things we do not know. And if we, if we knock, the door shall be open. So it's a, I think it's just us really just trying to, you know, it's like um, developing the relationship. Like when you first start dating someone or you, you know, first start going out with somebody, everything's really new at first. You're not, you know, you don't really have your bearings. You don't quite know what's going on. It's kind of like the same thing with God. When we first come to him, you know, we're completely clueless. And so, you know, just, just put your trust on him and, and talk to him and walk with him each day and, and he'll start to guide you. It'll get better and better. And you got to let the uh, evidence convince you. You gotta let the evidence yes. convince you. Yes, be you convinced. Convince yourself, believe on him. You can't. You have to look in scripture, look historically, do everything you can to feed your faith, and know it's true what he's done, and that it's very real. And then that the evidence needs to convince you of that truth. Mm -hmm. And you know God loves you because look what He did. He, he sent His Son to die for you. Of course He loves you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, my own experience at, uh, as um, in my conversion, it was uh, I didn't have evidence, really. Uh, I, uh, it was a time in my life where I needed answers. My mother had died, and for the first time, uh, I, I had to look at lo a loss of a loved one, and I needed to find out. What happens after we die? Is there a purpose of life? Is the Bible true? Well, which religion is true? And uh, the movie Jesus of Nazareth came on. It was in December of her death. So uh, I watched that movie, and I had seen it in the past, but this particular time, seeing the movie, it had an impact it never had before. And at the end of the movie, it, it scrolled down and through the credits, and the very last thing to come on the screen was, for more information, read the Bible. So <laughs> I started. I started reading the Bible, and I had enough sense to start reading in the, the New Testament. But I know I remember so clearly as I'm reading the Gospel of John. I know I got saved at that time. I, I when I understood his his this great love he had for me and what he did for me and this promise of eternal life. But I didn't have all the evidence and proof at that time. After after my initial faith, though. When I I became what well, my wife called me a Jesus freak. I mean, I I became so uh, interested in the Bible uh, that uh, everywhere I went, I had my Bible and I had other books to try to help me understand it. And and as I learned, studied uh, creation science and apologetics and 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 uh, uh, the um, um, uh, prophecies, and I, I I learned all these things that I didn't know before uh, my initial faith, that that was the evidence that reinforced my faith. Now, there are people that they need to get the evidence before they can believe. 
And then there's people like me, I'm sure there's many people like me, that we believe, and then later on we discover all the evidence that, that proves the, the point. So uh, I don't think a person necessarily has to. I know that uh, there's a there's a emphasis on seeking. Um, some, some of the brethren are, are, are talking about how important it is to be a seeker. And I was a seeker in that, in that I needed answers because of the deaths of my mother. So I definitely, I, I don't think you necessarily have to be a seeker. Sometimes like the Apostle Paul, I don't think he was seeking to learn about Jesus or the, to change his mind about his, his belief. Uh, he was seeking to destroy the church. And, and uh, you know, Jesus he just, and salvation, it fell into his lap. So I, I don't think everybody has to be diligently seeking, but when they when they hear the truth, uh, they can they can believe it, be and, convinced of it, right? Yeah, and other people, other people though they it, it just has to be a perfect time in their life where they recognize that there's something missing. They need answers as I did, and uh, um, in, in that case, you may not need all the proof first. But then there's a lot of people, as we know, that have written a lot of books who are great apologists now for uh, Christianity, and th they spent years attempting to disprove the Bible, and and uh, and as they studied it in that way, uh, they, they that evidence backfired on them. The, the evidence was compelling for the Bible instead of against it. Yep. Yep. Forgot the name of the guy. He, he he made a movie or a book or something called The Case for Christ. He was he, trouble. Yeah, he set out to disprove the Bible to get his wife out of Christianity. He's like, Well, I'll disprove this thing in a week and I'll have my wife back and you know, she won't be this Christian religious nut and we'll go back on to our life. And he set out to disprove it and what you know, what he said was gonna turn out to be a few days ended up being like a few years, and when he came to his conclusion, he he bowed his knee in, in trust yeah, in Christ. The evidence, he, he flat out just said, you win. The evidence proves is more for Christ being a real person that died on the cross and rose again. There is yeah. actual historical evidence for that. It would hold up in a case in, a, in an American court system. It would hold up as, as evidence for his resurrection. And if that's true, what else in the Bible is true? And finally, he came to the truth. That yeah, he researched it and found instead of fighting it, you know, see, God can, he's so merciful, man. He's just, he's so merciful to reveal <laughs> that to someone that hates him, you know? And then when they, when they realize their hatred for him is just like outshadowed by his love and mercy, they, they can't even stand it. <laughs> That's why you got to contend for the real gospel because God's love and true forgiveness and mercy is not manifest in a false gospel of you got to be good to get saved or keep salvation. That minimizes God's grace. It minimizes his love. It minimizes the atoning work. It minimizes the precious blood of Christ and it minimizes his suffering and it blasphemes the Holy Spirit. Yeah, for sure. And you know, it's funny you're talking about movies. Before I was a believer, I'm going to have to give a shout out to Mel Gibson, whether his movie's accurate or not. But that Passion of the Christ, that thing had me like, I don't know how to. I wasn't even a believer then when that movie came out. But man, that movie had me feeling some type of way. And I think God motivated that film. I, really I do too. I really do because. There's no I, Catholic garbage in it. There's nothing Catholic in that, in that movie. Some of the I mean, even if there was, I was so lost, I wouldn't know the difference. But I knew what they were, you know, the way the movie portrayed Christ and how he suffered and the whole point of it. And that movie did something to me, even though like at that time I was literally living like hell on wheels. I just, I don't know. That movie hit me. I gotta, I gotta give credit that that definitely planted a seed in me. Cause I remember like years later when I did come to the faith, like I watched that movie again and it was just even more amazing. Some of the scenes in that movie creeped me out a little, but yeah, I see your point. Caleb, I can't hear you, baby. What? Some of the scenes in that movie creeped me out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hey, um, Brother Luke was talking earlier. He's got a viewer that's really, and I get a lot of these too, so I wanted to bring it up. That I wanted to hear Paula's opinion. Are you there, Paula? Yep, I'm here. All right. I wanted to hear, Sister, your opinion on this. I, I'm upset with it. A lot of people, when they can't prove their doctrine or come against once saved always or eternal security, 
they use supernatural visions and so forth to try to prove that God showed them some new revelation because they can't stand on scripture with it. And so all these people <coughs> claiming Jesus gave them a tour of hell or took them to heaven, not one of them that I've seen has the real gospel. And they all preach a exactly. uh, 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 rely on your own righteousness. You got to turn from this sin and you'll go to hell if you wear makeup or you'll go to hell if you don't forgive this person or you're going to hell if you know, you're not tithing or whatever, whatever you don't repent of enough of your sin or whatever. So oh, none of them that I've seen have the real gospel. And the Bible clearly said Jesus in the story of Lazarus rich man is like, no, they got Moses and the prophets. I'm not sending anybody back from hell to warn your brothers. Uh, so, um, I, I think either they're lying or they have had a supernatural experience. Some of them I know are lying because they do it just to back up their, their theological doctrine. Uh, like that Dawkins guy. I know he made that up. Uh, but the other ones I believe could have had a supernatural experience like Bill Weiss, Mary Kay Baxter, uh, but they were deceived by lying spirits. That's my opinion on it. And it's really troubling people because it's another gospel and so they're all scared god's gonna torture them in hell for eternity because they didn't repent of enough sin nobody's ever repented of all their sin and that's not how you're saved anyway that's that's about temporal consequences and reward but but i've yet to see one what what are you guys are you guys dealing with a lot of this and what's your opinion on it well i've watched a video this one held testimony where this man, I don't, I don't remember his name. He said that he actually tested the spirits and he still saw the typical things that these other people claim they saw. And I'm like, you did not really test the spirits. You just believed what they said. I'm like, what? Come on now. You, if you tested the spirits rarely by asking them what the gospel is. Exactly. That's right. what do you mean you tested the spirits? I want to hear what you asked them. Yeah. <laughs> right. What did you ask them? Did you ask them what the real gospel is? I, I don't even remember the question. I was like, come on now. Yeah. And then this angel showed him a tour of he a hell. And basically, he saw the same thing that all these other people claim that they saw <laughs> demons tormenting people. Um, it was created I, for them. Exactly. They are not down there uh, uh, torturing people. They're scared. Why would they want to torture in the very place that they're scared of going to? That's the reason why the Legion of Demons asked Jesus not to cast them out of the man. Because he knew That's man-made tradition, Caleb. Yep. That's nowhere in scripture. Yep. Uh, it, yeah. Miss right. Paula, what, have you dealt with this? Not a lot, but I, I remember it wasn't that many years ago there was somebody uh, claimed this was an atheist and claimed to have been taken to heaven and given tours and told that he was going to have a special thing to do during the tribulation. And so many Christians bought it. They're just like, oh, this is amazing. This description of the music and the colors and the children and and I and they they didn't <laughs> test the spirits at all. And it, exactly. And and the thing is that in the Bible, there's only two people who went to heaven and came back, and only one was allowed to tell about it. Yeah, and that was God. Apostle John. Yeah, the but other Paul was Paul. wasn't allowed to speak of what he Paul. Heard. Yeah, Paul was taken up to the third heaven, but he was forbidden to speak on it. And here's the thing if the apostle Paul, who God used mightily, forbid him to speak on it, what makes these people, you know, just feel like they have this, this green light to just go saying all this stuff? And like Caleb was saying, when they right. visit hell, they always come back with a works gospel. Oh, I didn't repent enough. I didn't stop sinning. I didn't do awesome. this. I didn't do that. Kat Kerr claims <laughs> she's been going. She's gone over 30 times, but she calls the real gospel greasy grace. Oh, wow. And plus, even if that... Even well, if hold on. I don't mean to interrupt you, Caleb. Hold up. Renee, that's why she... <laughs> That's, that's why she's went over 30 times because God's trying to get her attention to get it right. Uh -huh. She keeps. <laughs> I don't mean to laugh. I'm sorry. But if you have to go visit hell 30 times and, and be taken to hell 30 times, 
You keep coming back preaching harder and harder works. Obviously, God's trying to get your attention. Uh, it, but yeah, even if all this stuff really does go on in heaven, what makes you think you could talk about it? <laughs> if Paul wasn't allowed to talk about it, what make what makes you think you're... I guess they think that... It says, right. I has not seen nor ear heard. Yep. I guess they think that they're special. It hasn't entered into the heart of man, and they always come back with some carnal understanding of it. It's just... It's, yeah. I, I, I think these are lying spirits. I really do. If they're having a supernatural revelation, I believe they're lying spirits. Do you think they they're are. even having them, Paula? I don't know. I mean, there are people, I, I knew some very sincere people on YouTube who, for example, on the rapture issue, would talk as though they were getting regular tours of heaven and that Jesus speaks to them personally. And one time he told them, this one lady said, I'm going to shut down my channel because he told me he's coming back in weeks to months, not years. Well, that was years and years ago. And obviously she was wrong. I believe she was sincere, but I believe that there are a lot of Christians who take either anything that pops into their head as God's voice, or they just have a really vivid imagination, or they are listening to a lying spirit somewhere on the, along the line. Some of, yep, some of that stuff is just imagination, especially with these dreams. It's yeah. I, yeah, I have yet to hear one of them with the real gospel. Not one like, not one like for example i don't i don't know if i told you i don't remember if i told you this renee i've been saying that i've had a dream of that i was speaking to god or whatever and i asked him what if the rapture was actually going to happen he said yes but i don't know if it was just actually him i don't know if it was just a dream if it was actually him, then he basically confirmed that the rapture is going to happen. Well, of course it's going to happen. It's in the Bible. Yeah. And yep. then and then all these other dreams, uh, uh, rapture dreams. I always, I'm always the one left behind. I'm like, come on. Really? That's That's anxiety and fear. Yeah, it, it's really getting annoying. I don't have those dreams anymore. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, good. Because that's anxiety and fear. I had those as a child. I had very vivid, lucid dreams, but it was in the house I lived in that was oppressed by an evil spirit, paranormal craziness going on in that house. And uh, I would have horrific, I still remember the dream to this day, and I don't remember my dreams, uh, but I would constantly, I was being left. I was being left, because that is what was being preached by fear in the churches. Yep, but I'm glad I don't have those dreams anymore. They were really annoying. That when you have dreams like this, you already know that you're going to get annoyed. The promise of, of meeting the Lord in the air is something we're supposed to comfort one another with. Yep. Not terrify people that are going to be excluded, but comfort one another that our Savior is, is faithful. And absolutely. And plus, no believer is going to be left on earth. There's not no no part. person truly trusting in Christ that is yep, not in Christ will be left. Nobody. He's not going to leave part of his body behind. Oh, okay. All right. So, uh, let me. Okay, you guys recognize this? Go ahead, brother. Say hi. Hello. Say hi to everybody. Hello. <laughs> okay. He's not really a man of few words. Is that Matt? To... I got Jack Smack on the phone hey, here. Uh, hey, uh, brother Jack Smack. Uh, I, first of all, just talk for a second. Can you think of anything to say for ten seconds so I can, we can test your audio? Just talk. Uh, testing one two three. Testing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can you hear him? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I can hear him. Oh, all right then. Okay, it's working. I'm just holding the speak my phone on speaker next to my microphone for you. But uh, the question, brother, is these uh, appearances of people going to heaven or hell and coming back with these accounts here. Where That's what we've been talking about. What, would you like to say anything about that? Some uh, out-of-body experiences? Yeah. Near-death experiences? Well, if you're coming back, uh, that's saying that transmigration is reversible. <laughs> You pass from death into life, and I don't see what it says you pass from life back into death. So I think it's funny the garbage. Yeah. Yeah. So someone mentioned Paul, and I, I believe that uh, 
Paul is the one he was referring to about, I knew a man and he went up to heaven. And he, uh, I think he was talking about his own experience. And I think that he actually died because remember he was actually stoned and left for dead. And uh, I believe he died at that point and went and had that experience and then uh, came back. But he was told he couldn't tell us about it. Uh, so if Paul could see heaven and he says he uh, couldn't tell us the details, why do these other people think that they should uh, be able to come back and give us their report? Are you asking that as a question? I'm, a, I'm telling everybody, but if you want to respond to it, brother. Well, they're doing it to make money. They're writing books on it. That's how they, that's, I mean, that's their, their way with all. Yeah. Of course, it's all live, but I mean, that's, that's their way of making money. It's a you know, shock value type, type deal. People are just, they're, they're hungry for anything that's just extraordinary and otherworldly and preternatural and trans mundane and all this, you know, really crazy stuff. It's like tabloid type stuff. Yeah. Hey, could you excuse me for a minute? I got to go get my dictionary. Um, Oh yeah, uh, I forgot. Uh, Jack Smack hooked on phonics. Yeah, all those uh, all those words you use routinely, brother. Uh, you're you're talking over my head half the time. Uh, I have to look up your words. <laughs> but yeah, uh, no, I, I, I did. I got the best vocabulary. I, I do understand a lot of what you say, but there are you do have a uh, the, a vast vocabulary beyond uh, most of us, I think. Uh, okay, uh, I'm going to just. Uh, we don't want to hijack the program, but uh, someone in the chat room from uh, asked in the previous program, we need to get Jack Smack on the program. And, uh, you know, he, he doesn't have the computer ability to do it. So the only way he can participate is I have to talk to him on the phone and put him on speaker. So uh, that's why he'll, he'll be with us for a little while tonight. And uh, so carry on, everybody. I don't, we don't want to take over the program. So hey, that uh, book that Todd Burpo uh went to heaven book heaven is real book it came out that it was all fake the parents had told the little boy what to say and then added the uh detail of him having a little sister that had died at birth and so they made it sound uh -oh. right that came out as uh fake when he got older he, he said yeah my parents told me to say all that wow so, I well, you know, and they sold a billion copies <laughs> of that book yeah Oh, they make well, some good money. Jack Smack was right about that. They do it for uh, publicity. They do it to make a name for themselves. They do it to feel important, admired, uh, try to go on a little tour of speaking and make money off the uh, book sales. It, I mean, it's a lot of junk. Now, supposedly thousands upon thousands of vi uh, visitations to hell or to heaven, and yet they all come back preaching another gospel. I mean, how, how much more like evidence do we need? And an unbiblical hell, too. And unbiblical. Well, Renee, I, I bet everybody saw that video you made a week or so ago about the woman that claimed she came back, but the message she came back with was just sickening, wasn't it? Yes, it made yep. me sick. Made I me saw sick. That Blatant work salvation. Claim that once saved, always saved is the biggest deception. It's of the devil. Then she has the nerve to pray. Help us rest in your assurance. Insurance of what? How good you are? Right. I mean, you're denying the true foundation. And I think people like Bill Weiss, I think he's sincere. I think whatever vision he had scared him to death. And I think he was never saved. He's one of those, you got to repent of your sins to be saved. Brother, you have not repented of all your sins. If that is the qualification for salvation, every one of us is going to hell tonight. Well, you know, that woman that you made the video about, uh, she came back with a message that, that Jesus is actually a genie. And oh, yeah, get, she had three get, bitches. She wanted a get, Cape Cod cabin, uh, a four-wheel drive, and world peace, but she was willing to forego for a uh, world peace so she could have the other two. Yeah. Oh, wow. so, yeah. So, guys, guys, if you die and go to heaven, you get three wishes, according to her. Yeah. She was like, well, I got my three and guess where she was? This was another red. Well, I knew she was fake the minute I heard her because her gospel message was wrong. But uh, I, I've just gotten, I can pick it. I can spot it like in a second. I know when it's, I, I don't like it, but I, I'm so protective over the truth of the gospel. I, I got ears. Like I got the, I can find the little subtle things and I try to help people see those. But she was in. I hop. Everybody thought it was International House of Pancakes, but it was uh, International House of Prayer. 
which has all kinds of lying signs and where gold dust and the fire tunnels and the meditation and all the new age stuff that's coming in. They're having all these bizarre manifestations. Definitely another spirit in IHOP. Yes, and that's where she had this vision. Okay, and I thought it was, oh, good. I was taken out of my body. Well, uh, Paul said he didn't know he was in the body or out of the body, but you do. I, I thought of a question for everybody, and that is, uh, is there anything good on TV as far as Christian programs? Uh, uh, the ones I've seen, they're all heretical. I can't yep, think of any of it. Real as it does anybody is anybody aware of anything that's actually the real gospel being preached on TV? I have one, it's called Tortured for Christ. It's the true story of a <laughs> communist, uh, in a communist country. I can't remember if it's it Romania or something, but it's a story of these martyrs and how they suffered through the communist regime. And I don't recall hearing anything heretical that it was all about the love of Christ. Uh, it's still not completely clear on how to get saved, but if you already know and you are saved, there's nothing in it that would offend you. And well, I'm not talking. I'm not talking about something that maybe we we no, will not necessarily find fault in it. Okay, I'm I'm asking: Is there somebody on TV who has a big TV program who's really yeah. preaching the real gospel? Nope. Anybody? Nope. Nope. Ch Charles oh, Stanley, the only one. Nothing. I oh, Charles say, Stanley, we exposed him a couple Jeremiah. weeks ago. Dr. David, David Jeremiah. Yeah, I heard Jeremiah a few years ago, and I remember that I liked him, but I don't know. Is he still on all the time? Uh, yeah, he's still yeah. on. Dr. J David Jeremiah. Charles Stanley used to be right on the gospel. Yeah, he's not. He's I not. think he's, he's uh, bent the will to the Lordshippers now. And uh, it, oh. I believe, and a lot of people get mad at me, but Joseph Prince preaches the right gospel. Yeah, he does, but does he have a TV show or yeah, is he just he's internet? Very big. Yes. Okay, so Joseph Prince. But you know, I've heard a lot of but people. He's word that, of faith, brother Luke. He's the health, wealth, prosperity guy too. So yeah. There is isn't, that, isn't that crazy that here he is with with that error, but at least he's preaching the real gospel. Yeah. And, and and you could actually say that he is uh, the full what people say is a pejoratively uh, hyper grace. As yeah. though we're, we're, we're overdoing the grace, yeah. but really he he's preaching hyper super abounding grace the way it really is. Well, grace if you have to do something for grace or be good enough to receive grace, it's not grace. Yeah, it's it's, it, it, it's either it's either uh, super abounding or it's not even grace at all. Right, grace at all. Uh, right. Yeah, but so uh, Prince does that. Yes, but I wouldn't necessarily hold it against him. Uh, if he's teaching that, uh, you know, prayers, uh, prayers are being answered. Let's pray. Let's pray for each other. Let's lay our hands. Let's anoint with yeah, oil. I'm fine with that. Let's, I know let's pray for prosperity that. and be, let's pray for blessings. We all do that. Yeah. But I, I don't know how far he goes with it. Well, he believes that you stand on the promises of God and, and, you know, that comes with all the financial blessings and health blessings. So I think he might go a little far there, but, um, he is uh, on the true gospel, and he. Let me, has, ask, let me has, ask Jack Smack if he, uh, Let me ask Jack Smack. Are, are you aware of anybody on TV that's preaching the real gospel, brother? Well, I mean, I think Tony Evans. I think he's on TV. He preaches the correct gospel. Yeah, Tony Evans. Uh, yeah, I remember him from many years ago. I, I had some of his CDs, and uh, he. Uh, he was preaching the right gospel even back then, but uh, he did preach one thing that I, I don't even want to bring up the subject because it, it'll just get me in trouble. But uh, yeah, he's, uh, I do remember he had the right gospel, but it was so many years ago. Sometimes people change uh, under under pressure. Dr. Uh, Tony Evans still preaches the, the gospel. Yeah. Okay. So Joseph, you can listen to Joseph Prince. You can listen to uh, uh, Evans uh, and um, Jeremiah. Those yeah, Joseph Prince free. has a good series on true repentance. What what repent in regards to salvation means? Uh huh. Uh, and it's ironic because he's like best friends with Joel Osteen, who preaches the repent of your sins, ask Jesus in your heart, false gospel message. Yeah. So, somebody in the chat asked about Derek Prince, and I just want to let them know that he's highly sought after for like deliverance and things like that. 
But there's there's plenty of clips of him saying that you can lose your salvation, and and I would stay away from Derek Prince. He's a uh, Pentecostal. Derek, Derek Prince rather than Joseph Prince. Yeah, the, no, they were asking about Derek Prince in the comments, and he's very very sought after for things like, uh, you know, spiritual warfare. He he teaches a lot of stuff about naming demons and all this stuff, and he goes a little deep with it. But I understand people; it, it sparks their curiosity, but. If you listen to him preach the message, he he says if you don't obtain a certain level of holiness, you can go to hell. Uh, if you don't repent of your sins, you go to hell. Uh, he's very dangerous when it comes to the gospel. Yeah. One of the viewers just said that Joseph Prince taught free grace, but he says if you're really saved, you won't remain in sin. <clears throat> so that's People what like that get on my nerves. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I mean, there's nowhere in script. As a matter of fact all of the letters are trying to encourage people out of sin once they're saved. It's not something that automatically happens just yeah. because they're saved. That that takes work. Yeah. But, you know, uh, we have to be careful, too, that uh, to repeat things and, and become hearsay, you know, and, uh, unless you have actually heard him say it yourself. Yeah, uh, I can actually well, provide the links. I can provide the links for the Derek Prince guy. I actually have them saved because I actually uh, bought his books. I used to listen to him a lot. And, you know, because early in my walk, like God was allowing certain things to happen. And, okay. and, and I was seeing you heard, even, you heard even him to this day. Yeah, you no, heard even Derek Prince, but, but what about Joseph, Joseph Prince? What, and the I didn't hear him say it like that. But what the I The accusation did, against Joseph, Joseph Prince. Yeah. The, the what person, I heard Joseph Prince say was if a person continues in a like a heavy addiction and a lot of sin they're not abiding in his grace that's what i heard him say that they're not really in his grace because his grace will start to set you free from that that's what i heard him say i heard it i haven't heard him say well, you know uh, really the, 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 the basis of the basis of uh pelagianism was the heresy that um you have to be perfect to be saved so it is by works but grace it gives you the ability to be perfect that's what yeah, i've heard grace. that argument too so that sounds like uh kind of what you're he's saying there no that, joseph prince isn't saying that he's saying that it's the grace of god that that gives us the desire to grow and be obedient I and i haven't heard joseph prince say anything heretical as far as the gospel's concerned i thought they were talking about Derek prince who is absolutely uh uh you know, heretical when it comes to the gospel. Well, um, but Joseph okay. Prince, no. I mean, I, I've I've only heard him say that grace will uh, guide us and give us desires yeah. to well, live godly. Upper that's what I heard too. Yeah. 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 Let, let, let me say this for everybody, okay? I, I believe this is what the protocol we should all be applying here. Let's let's uh, listen. Be willing to listen to anybody, but let's scrutinize them uh, and uh, ourselves instead of. Uh, falling prey to hearsay and accusations because you know all of us have been have had accusations made against us too so unless we hear it for ourselves so listen to all these people but the test should be are they saying works are required to gain salvation are they saying works are required to keep your salvation are they saying that works are required to prove your sal salvation if they violate any of those, if they're saying any of those things, then you can, then you're, it's fair to judge against them. Right, right. Somebody um, mentioned Les Feldick. He was good. He was a good Bible teacher. No, Les Feldick is a, um, uh, uh, he, he, there's nothing wrong with his gospel. He believes the gospel as we do. He is a champion of a hyper dispensationalism, what I call Paul onlyism. He's probably the most prominent person today. He used to be called Bollingerism, uh, but uh, watch my playlist, Paul Onlyism Debunked, uh, to see my grievances against that. But uh, Les Feldick and all the other Hyper Ds, they are saved. They do believe the real gospel. Some people in the chat want me to bring up this guy. He's a uh, he's not on TV or he's not well known, like I guess in the. Um, you know, the book world or the preacher world, but he's very, very, uh, he's probably one of the largest uh, social media preachers that are out here today. His name is Marcus Rogers. Um, he's a oneness uh, Pentecostal. He uh, claims direct uh, divine revelation, new revelation from God. He, call, he basically calls himself a super prophet. He's uh, He teaches that if you don't speak in tongues, you don't have the Holy Spirit. 
He teaches that you can lose your salvation, and he has about 900,000 followers. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that speaking, that if you couldn't speak other languages, you could go to hell. Yeah. Wow. No, he's he's talking about the robo show blah 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 stuff. Yeah. Uh, he's so not talking ask about Charles Lawson too. Now Charles Lawson used to be right on the gospel, but he Yeah, he fell off. <laughs> he's, he's fell off the grace wagon and he's a, Lord, he's, a, he's a backloader. He's a backloader. Yeah, he's a backloader. There you go. He's a, he's yeah, backloader and, works. You know, we, we've been talking about some of these people that are prominent and I uh, giving our opinion of whether they're are worthy to listen to or not. And I, I think we should also talk about our friends on the internet. Hey, brother, Billy's here from Billy, Nairobi, Nairobi, Kenya. Hey, blessings, brother. Uh, yeah. Brother but, Billy. Uh, listen, what, uh, I asked the question about television, but what no, most of us are getting our um, uh, this information from YouTube now or from the internet. So who's good on the internet? If you go to my home page, Sin City Preacher, and I, I just modified my list recently, and it says uh, some of my favorite channels. And I've got, uh, I think, 10 or 12 on the list now, and some of you here are, are newly additions to that list. Of course, Brother Jack Smack's been on it for about 11 years now. On my I list. was going to tell you, Luke, Jack Smack, years ago when I first got saved and I was stuck in the uh, – you know, I, I started out in the Pentecostal church and, and, you know, I was always struggling and I found Jack, I found Jack Smack's channel and I was like, wait a minute, what he's preaching makes sense. That's how I read it. That's how I understand it. But why is my pastor, why are they all so hard and why are they always so condemning? Why are they always so like, like, man, we ain't perfect, you know, and I, I started wow. struggling. So I think I listened to every one of Jack Smack's videos. I think I love the brother. I mean, I would literally give him a Xanax or two, so he'll just calm down a little bit. But other than that, like, he he helped me out so much. Oh, brother Dave's on Xanax, huh? How many of those do you have, brother? I might need some myself. <laughs> no, no. I was, just, I was just using it as an example. I was just saying that to calm him down. You know, Jack Smack is like a – he's like a pit bull, man. That's my, that's my attempt at humor. Hey, brother Luke, I'm going to yeah. give the viewers three – preachers that i think are very clear in defense of the gospel two of them are dead i think dr curtis, curtis hudson. hudson curtis hudson j vernon mcgee yes and dr david woods i never heard of woods but the others are great i like vernon mcgee a lot yeah dr david woods Renee, tell You're your chat to grab something to write. Uh, tell your chat to grab something to write these down with. Let's let's t let them write these names down hey. so they can look into them. Hey guys in the chat room, write these names down. These are good gospel preachers. Yeah. Curtis Hudson, H U T S O N, J Vernon McGee, and Doctor David Woods. Yeah. If you like, if you like, if you like Yankee Arnold. Course, you, you know, you know I was going to say that. <laughs> if you like uh, Yankee Arnold, then uh, the uh, there's kind of a genealogy of that particular church. Yankee Arnold, uh, he followed the uh, 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 Hank Lindstrom. I love Doctor Hank Lindstrom. And Hank Lindstrom followed Curtis Hudson. That's the genealogy. I of didn't those know that Curtis Hudson uh, was before Hank Lindstrom. Yeah, yeah, That's Curtis great. Hudson. Hudson, Lind Lindstrom, and Arnold. What a great uh, threesome that is. Uh, so let me ask Jack Smack if you, you're still with us. He's uh, uh, you, You've been listening, brother. Uh, brother Dave uh, just acknowledged you. And, you know, I get people every single day sending me comments and uh, acknowledging other people that they uh, help them so much. And the two people that are mentioned over and over and over and ever again is Jack Smack and Renee Rowland. And uh, you guys are, I, I, so Jack Smack, I know you're a very humble person, and, and uh, but it, it is good for us to tell you sometimes that you are greatly appreciated. Do you have anything to say, brother? Yeah, but if you do what Paul did, you're going to get what Paul got: stoned, beaten, <laughs> shot. Yeah, I mean, 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 I mean,
shipwrecked. Raided, persecuted, yeah. slandered. Called all kinds of names. Yeah. Jack Smack, have you had anybody insult you or come against you? They what? What did what did they do? Pull the knife out. Oh yeah, but on the internet, have you had anybody insult you? Well, these stupid unsaved idiots out there—they they come on my, you know, they leave stupid comments on my channel. I usually just block them. Yeah, that's <laughs> There's right. a bunch of unsaved idiots out there. <laughs> a bunch of stupid, stupid I told unsaved. you. I told you he's a pit bull. He's a pit bull. <laughs> yeah. But uh, okay, bunch Again, of Calvinist bastards. You got to burn. Did you hear? Did you hear what <laughs> Brother Jack Smack said? He doesn't have a problem with because he just blocks them. And you know what? I start. I adopted that policy many years ago. It, 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 I, I'll give a person a chance. Uh, but but if I determined uh, after one or two problems with, with them that I, I my life I don't want my life uh, being antagonized and if uh, if they're going to just be there to antagonize me they get blocked so uh, I've I have probably over 500 people on the on my blocked list right now and I I think that some of you I won't mention any names like Renee or anything but I'm just, I think some of you need to start blocking some people yeah. Who, who are just out there to ruin your life and make you miserable. You need to learn, hey, these people need to be blocked. Yeah. We need to remember that John the Baptist, when he saw the Pharisees coming, he wasn't nice and, and affirming to them at all. He just sent them away and says, you're coming for all the wrong reasons. You're, you're, you haven't repented, but that's what he was preaching. And he just sent them away. He did not give them a minute of his time and and neither did jesus he never said a kind word to the pharisees and i think that's a good policy because they will just waste your time yeah. that's all they'll yeah. do yeah so, not only did jesus ha have all these harsh things to say to the self-righteous religious hypocrites of the pharisees but i don't see any record of him having ongoing debates with any one individual thank you can i say something tonight please uh, yeah. I am learning a lot from Luke and I, and I, I give way too much patience for people that come in and go, what? well, no, cause you can lose it and you can do this. And then I answer their questions cause I'm hoping I have had some people that are Renee, I did the same thing for them. years. It'll, it'll drain you girl. Right. And I know there's some that have come to truth, but the, the bottom line is, they are enemies of the cross. And somebody keeps writing me saying, you know, I, I really want this argument to stop. What, there is no argument within the body of Christ. These people are not part of the body of Christ. They have not believed the gospel. They yep. preach against it. They mock it as greasy grace, cheap grace, something. Just because they say they love Jesus and they're trying to live right doesn't make them a born-again believer. They have not believed the gospel, and if they speak against the gospel and hate the gospel and deny the sufficiency of Christ, they are his enemy. And we need to just accept this. doesn't mean we're cruel or mean, but uh, today somebody asked me, this guy's speaking a lot of ill about you and making videos. Would you be willing to come debate him? I said, I don't debate the gospel. I preach it, and when people reject it, there's nothing I can do to convince them. God has to. So yeah. I don't even know why I would waste my time. Hey, hey <laughs> Sister, why don't we, can we take just a minute and ask Brother Billy to give us some thoughts? Because he's been here and I haven't heard him saying. Amen. Thank you for coming, Billy. Hey, Billy. You're muted, bro. Your yeah, microphone Billy. is muted, Billy. Billy, if you'd unmute and and uh, let's let's hear your thoughts. You've been listening a little while. If you have any thoughts, you want to share with us? Yeah. So, um, when earlier you said about the pastors on TV, um, I started like my grace walk with with Joseph Prince. Yeah, that was about in two thousand and eight. So later, I came to learn that um, you know the Prosperity part of it might be tricky, but the rest of the stuff he says is actually been good. Like someone said earlier, like he's the one who showed me from the Bible that repent means to change your mind. Yeah, repent is not about stopping and 
stopping sinning and all. no it's begin, it begins it means change your mind like metanoia so that was a big deal yeah so then um of course there's the more controversial creflo dollar yeah um he recently began taking the grace gospel but it was recently and also, and as some guys say you know his name is creflo dollar for reason <laughs> Anyway, so yeah, there's that. And then um, Andrew Womack is also good. Um, like TV preachers, Andrew Womack is good. And yeah, so the last one? I didn't get the name. Andrew Womack. Oh, Womack. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, now, so, let me ask you, if you know about Creflo Dollar, uh, it's, it's a strange name. Is that his actual last name, Dollar? Hey, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. <laughs> oh, okay. If it, does anybody know? Is his name really Dollar? Yes, Creflo Dollar. Yeah, that's strange. I've never heard of that. Yeah, it is apropos. It should be, uh, unfortunately, uh, it's too bad it's, uh, it's actually a description of his, uh, his heart. <laughs> it seems to me. I don't know. Maybe he has changed, as you say, Brother Billy. But No, he has not changed. He just said he wanted a $65 million jet because God wanted him not to have to stop and gas up the old one. Um, yeah, brother like Jack Smack said the phone call dropped. Um, yeah, I know it dropped, but he can call me back if he wants. He was just let, he was just letting you know in the chat, brother Luke. Oh, well, I I knew because I have the phone. <laughs> yeah, he uh, Preflin I was, uh, said he would like to have a device like they have at the uh, amusement parks that you walk through one at a time, and when you don't tie, they would trap you in it. And they take all the non-tithers out back and dig a big ditch and shoot them all with machine guns and they would fall into the ditch and then he'd go in and preach an anointed sermon to those that have enough faith to give 10% of their money to God. Yeah. yeah. He's an idiot. Yeah, that's what he said. Well, I want to give a shameless plug real quick to uh, Florida Bible College of Tampa. Shout out to Ralph Yankee Arnold. My uh my uh, my Bible pastor and Bible college teacher currently, and um, if anybody wants to listen to some solid grace messages, solid teachings, I highly recommend Ralph Yankee Arnold. And if you want to listen to some more fiery Baptist style preachings, but the correct gospel, you want to write down a name, uh, James Knox. He does, he's a really good Baptist preacher, got the right gospel, eternal security, no backloading works, um, but he's really fiery <laughs> for the people that like that kind of preaching. And then for people that like the soft teaching style, uh, pure gospel, absolutely Ralph Arnold. Let me say to uh, uh, Sister Paul, I saw a comment in the chat room that uh, she, you wouldn't block anybody because of hyper dispensationalism. <laughs> And I, I agree. I, I wouldn't block anybody over any kind of dispensationalism. Uh, is Jack Smack calling me back? Okay, there you are, back again. We were just talking about you. Did your did, did you were your ears burning? Okay, he he just got some fuel. Everybody, he ate, so now he's all fueled up. There's no telling what he's going to do now. Hmm. Right. <laughs> Okay. Do you guys have any idea how massive Jack Smack is? Like his arms are this big. Yeah, uh, brother, are you, are you getting close to that record you're shooting He's for? His, his, his arms, arms are like this. Are you getting close to that goal? Well, you told me your goal was to get the biggest, most muscular arms. Are you getting close to that? Oh, no. I mean, it just takes years, it takes decades. Decades, okay. Still, work, yeah, still working. Hard. You're still working hard at it, though? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I worked up somewhere about, about puke. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's a big dude. <laughs> he's a big dude. Yeah. Hey, uh, oh, well, let me say this to everybody while I got everybody's listening here tonight. Um, you know, we're, we're going to have a Las Vegas meeting here for the Church of the Eternally Secure. Uh, everybody who... Uh, uh, considers them part of part of the congregation where you're invited to come to las vegas we don't have a date set yet there's about a dozen people who have told me that uh they are, are committed to come uh, they're going to come if at all possible 
but we have about 600 people who are usually participating in these programs. So I don't know how many uh, will actually come, but uh, if you are interested, then you need to contact me and then give me uh, two time frames that, that might work for you. And then I'm going to look at which time frames overlap for the most people to decide the date. And once we get a date, then we'll start our planning. So I hope I hope we can all get together one time under one roof and and, and have a fellowship uh, without the internet, but just uh, in person. I wish I could, but I don't have any money to go to Vegas. Hey, hey, Paula, Paula, I saw your uh, comment in there. It says I don't like videos where it has people destroying Bibles just because they're not King James. I'm guilty of that. About three years ago, I got so frustrated because I was trying to, uh, uh, my son's aunt wanted me to show her something or explain something in Hebrews. So I said, okay, bring me your Bible. And I turned to Hebrews and they had twisted the whole section of Hebrews 10. And it made it seem like uh, it was, instead of the willful sin being the rejection of the sufficiency of the blood of Jesus and there being no more sacrifice for sin, obviously because he died once for all and they're not gonna accept animal sacrifices. Uh, it turned into like you can send away the blood of Jesus. I got so mad that I threw it across the room. And then I did a video and I said, how to read an NIV. And I have a baseball bat just smacking it. <laughs> so I am guilty of doing one of those uh, videos. But that was why, because I was so frustrated. I believe somebody can be saved from an NIV. I do. But I, I feel there's that they are interpretations, not translations. So I, I think that's somebody trying to interpret what God is saying and based on what they think they're saying. And I'm not King James only. I, I'm just, it's just my preferred. I've seen some other translations that are very, very close. Um, but I'm guilty of doing that very thing. Yeah, yeah the, the thing is, it's a bad witness. Um, when unbelievers see that sort of thing, they, they don't know differences. They just right. see Christians burning bibles basically and that's such a bad witness but yeah i will say on on translations i probably read about all of them um they all have blind spots they all have parts they're really good at and really bad at i know there's a calvinistic bias in the niv there's a divine right of kings bias in the kjv there's yes there um, is you're right about that. And a patriarchal thing, too, where they limit. Yeah, yeah. That, that's the universal bias. Yeah. Um, so there, there's no such thing as a perfect translation. But there are some, I, I think it matters what the intent of the translators were. I, I would certainly not recommend the New World Translation of the Jehovah's Witnesses or the, um, the message. Or the Catholic Bible. But, yeah, there's the Douay Reims. I think there's another one they use now. The Message but. Bible's so bad. And then they have one that they, uh, the New Apostolic Reformation created their own Bible called the Passion Bible, which is just so full of heresy. I've only seen snippets of that, but I didn't like what I saw. I, I oh, just thought um, they were going the wrong way. This subject reminds me of a question I wanted to ask you, Paula. Uh, as, as watching your videos and your references and you're using the, the Greek there, uh, which is the, which is source are you using for for the Greek? Which manuscript source? I tend to favor the critical text, the earlier text, over the Textus Receptus. Um, there are a lot of comparisons. I even have there's a link on my channel or not my channel, my um, blog somewhere that lets you compare two or three manuscript families at once. And from research I've been able to look up, the differences are the so-called missing verses are the one that people hang up on because everything else is usually about spellings, um, weights and measures, and tri fairly trivial things. But in my opinion, those verses are not missing. They're not original. But the ones that are missing, and I, I did a, a video on this recently where I compared, I just looked through the list on Matthew because I found a site that said, look at all these missing verses. And I just went through the ones on Matthew because there were so many. And I said, look, it isn't here, but it is there. It isn't here, but it is there. Um, and I just went down the list of the so-called missing verses and I couldn't find where those translations were trying to leave something out. It's just, they're using the different Greek manuscript. And, that and they're, putting, manuscript, they're putting the missing verses in the footnotes. 
yeah, yeah. a lot of times they do because yeah. they said some manuscripts have such and such and they're yeah. just being honest about well, it. that that those missing verses uh, whether they are whether they uh, the truth is that they were inserted or whether they were omitted by the or either way you look at it uh, they uh, uh, they're important to me. That's why the KJV I use as a uh, as a litmus test against the others, because I want all the verses, uh, and then I'll I'll decide if it's uh, making my own judgment whether it should be there or not. But I think it should be, particularly we got First John five seven and First Timothy three sixteen. These are such important verses. Uh, um, uh, God God was manifest in the flesh is different than he was manifest in the flesh or Jesus was manifest in the flesh. And of course, the one with uh, uh, 1 John 5, 7, where there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. This is the um, the, the penultimate verse that we use to, to justify the, the triunity of God. And, is that and in the Texas Receptus, uh, Luke, the yeah. three are one? And yeah, it's that, not in the critical? Yeah, well, I don't know about the critical. I just know that it's not in the modern translations. It's it's completely left out. But uh, obviously, we, we don't have to have those verses to conclude Jesus is God. We don't have to have those verses to conclude the, 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 the Trinity. Uh, but they are some of the most important verses that make the point, though. Yeah, I just think the, the point... The way I look at it, the way the critical text users look at it, is that these concepts are not missing. And that it isn't a, a fair comparison of translations when it's a matter of underlying Greek manuscripts. And we're not Greek scholars. You know, they argue about these things, as, and we're not, um, you know, experts in, in textual transmission and things like that. So, I think we need to have grace on the matter and not um, shut people out for that. I think that's the most important thing. And that's well, the principle yeah. here. So yeah, I think everybody everybody here is tolerant of other people's uh, Bible, which Bible they're using. Uh, I don't know anybody that's going to shun another person over that. But, no. uh, uh, but we, right. we all have our levels. We all have our degrees of, 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 of preference. Well, and some are KJV only. Some are like me are KJV first, and some are like the always go to the Greek or or uh, some other translation. Yeah, well, someone's going to say something. Has Paula uh, found anything in the critical text that's not in the Textus Receptus? Um, you mean that it has? Oh, oh I see what you're saying. No, um, as far as I know, the the critical text is also called the eclectic text because it's a collection you've got all these texts and they're trying to use them to come up with the original and that that's i think a sound approach but oh. there's nothing in as far as i can remember there's nothing in the critical text that is not also in the texas receptus okay. but the opposite but true. there may be but yeah right but in texas receptus there's verses that aren't in the critical yeah okay. right well, I'd like to ask in so the critical people's argument against these three or one, they go, that wasn't in the original. And so is the verse uh, that says um, there is no more condemnation for those in Christ Jesus who walk after the spirit, not the flesh. That section is not in the uh, original, they say. Right. It's in a different place, though. OK, so I, I can't even remember the title of my own videos sometimes, but I did one on um Bible versions recently, and I went over those. Like I said, I went through a list, I think, toward the end of a video. Um, so if you're curious about specific instances, um, that might be something to watch sometime. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Paula, do you know if the critical text, is that what they consider the Alexandrian text or the Alexandrian manuscripts? Somewhat, but not completely. There's not a one-to-one -one relationship. But by critical and eclectic, they mean that they considered all the manuscripts they could get their hands on. So it isn't just an Alexandrian text. When I saw, I don't know, um, you know, I don't know too much in-depth detail about it, but I know what I've learned from, uh, you know, Pastor Arnold. And, you know, he, he made it clear in a couple of our classes. Um, for instance, the Texas Receptus in the King James Bible in 1 John 3, 9, where it says, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. 
the the word that was actually supposed to be there was poeo, which was actually translated in the King James, but the newer versions swapped out the Greek word poeo for prazo, and then they switched it from does not commit sin to does not go on practicing sin. And I don't um, I don't I don't understand why they would take even from um, you know, older or supposedly more accurate uh, manuscripts. Why they would, why they swap out Greek words to almost it. It almost feels like they're 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 backloading works into the gospel. I I would have to disagree on that on why they would do that because for one thing they're just going with what the uh, they feel is the most accurate text in the Greek, and if it has that word, then that's the word they're going to use, and that word does mean. To continue practicing. That's just part of that's its semantic range and its grammar at that point is you don't live in sin, which is matches up with what Paul taught that in Romans, how if we we died to sin, how could we live in it any longer? And the same John who some people quote of you know in first John saying that the believer does not sin, also said, But if we do sin, we have an advocate. So it isn't as but though, I, but I think the the I think the King James in First John three is is literally saying, because of the whosoever is born of God, the seed of God is in him, and he cannot sin, meaning that our sins have already been crucified, like we've been crucified from our flesh. So like eternally, our sins are not even held against us. And so to change right. something that says, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, which the King James Bible was translated from the Texas Receptus. And the word was pueo in the Greek, but the modern versions changed it to prazo, which you said does mean not to go on practicing. I just don't understand why the change. Um, well, they didn't change it, though. They're using a different Greek text is the thing. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? They're, they didn't say, we don't like this word, we're going to substitute another. They just said, this is the word that we think is probably original. And by the way, the, the the one who can't sin is the seed of Christ. Right, because he's the born of God. The seed of Christ can't sin. He can't commit sin even once, and he can't practice sin either, because it's not possible to bring forth fruit from the seed of Christ, mm -hmm. fruit of sin. So right. the one in that verse that doesn't sin or cannot sin, whether it's practice hey, or do it once, she's it's the seed of Christ it. that can't sin. She, she's untwisting it. Oh, the a lot of people, sister. you know, say that the word poyo, which means can't even do it once, right? It's a one-time event. You can't, you can't sin, not possible even once. But if you put the word prazo there, sorry, my computer came up plug. You put the word prazo there, now it's been turned into something that's habitual or practicing. Well, either way, it's still the same because it's talking about the seed of Christ is in him and he can't sin. The seed of Christ can't sin. So it doesn't matter if it's practiced or perform at once. Well, I, I think if, if we understand that we're already seated in heavenly places, and that, and that, Amen. and that, we were, uh, we're not, we cannot sin. But here, but it's, right. uh, a lot of people try to use that and go, see, if you're really saved, you don't keep on sinning. And I'm like, come on, dude, are you that deceived to think that's what it means? That you don't sin anymore. You really can say that. You're gonna put that standard on me and think you actually achieved it. You know, I don't. I don't really recommend all of his teachings, but there is a, a video out there by a guy named Kent Hoven. Um, he he does a really good series on the Textus Receptus versus the Alexandrian scripts. I don't and, know Kent Hoven. I, I think he no, did Ken, really Ken well about creationism and so forth. Kent Hoven has the right gospel. He just That's for good. some. For, for some people, he just goes out there a little bit too far. But hey, he well, has judging him because of his divorce, and it's absolutely horrible. Right, he... right. But he does have a very excellent uh, series on the different translations and why he, you know, like Luke said earlier, brother Luke said earlier, it's a preference. Some people they just don't like the KJV, and that's fine. I'm not a KJV only person. But me personally, I'm I'm KJV all the way. And if I if I can't get my hands on a KJV, then I'll settle for something else if I have to. But if I'm looking for a KJV and all the way. But other people that just don't feel comfortable with it, they don't like it, and that's fine. But what I like about what Kent Hoven did is he from a like a non, you know, just a like Paula said, just from the the text versus the text, the script versus the script. 
he breaks it down and shows the difference uh, in the wordings and, and, and where they came from. And it was something very interesting he said with the uh, Alexandrian scripts. A majority of those scripts were found where the biblical ancient Babylon was. And there's even a text in the Bible about how God hated the ways of the Alexandrians. <laughs> so I just, I, don't, I just wanted to throw that out there. It was pretty interesting. Yeah. What sister well, came in? We got a sister. Hey, sister. Hello. It's Natalie. Hey, oh, hi, girl. You? you got your hair up. You're wearing yeah, your hair. Ah, oh, there you go. Well, mm -hmm. good to have you. Mm -hmm. It's good, good to, to see you, you, Natalie. Hello, everybody. Yeah. It's nice to see hi. you all. Hey, let me, uh, can I have the last word on this before we go on to another subject here? Uh, yeah, no, I, I just don't want anybody thinking I'm trying to be biased. I appreciate everybody's input and opinion, and I like to study and look into everything. It's just for yeah. me personally, I've, I haven't, what Paula was saying, I haven't really heard that point. So I might go check out her video on, on the whole eclectic text thing. And because the, the last time I studied it, I, I think I ended off with uh, Dr. Kent Hovind's series on the uh, Texas Receptus versus the uh, newer manuscripts. I, I just want to encourage everybody, whether it's this subject, uh, deciding about the Bible translation question uh, or any other theological matter, uh, I think it's healthy for us to uh, list, look at all points of view and consider all points of view. Absolutely. If you, if you, if you just go with whatever teacher taught you something and you're going to follow whatever that teacher said and you're committed to it. I did for 25 years. I was a Ruckmanite. I was as strict KJV only as anybody you've ever met. And, and, uh, uh, and, and not only with that, but but Ruckman's view on dispensational futurism and, and uh, everything. I, I just bought into everything he said and almost thought he was infallible. I admired him and respected him so, that much. Uh, but I, as I started opening up my mind to say, oh, well, people disagree with me. Well, let me, I decide, I want to hear what they have to say. And there's been a few subjects where, because I was willing to listen um, and, and with an open mind, uh, I set my prejudice aside temporarily and give, really give them a fair hearing, uh, I found out that I was actually wrong. And uh, there's a saying that, that uh, who but a stubborn fool would hold on to their error once it's been exposed. So I just encourage everybody on all theological subject matter, be willing to hear out the other side of an argument and be fair and considerate. The worst thing that can happen is, well, you may not change your mind, but now you understand the other person's point of view. Hey, uh, Brother Luke, we got Kimberly in the chat rooms posting a bunch of First John. He who sins is of the devil. And okay, we, we need to look at First John because a lot of people try to use this to say, see if you're really saved. Yeah, apart, apart, apart from the righteousness. Yeah. 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 You know, sin goes still in the flesh. That sin is imputed to them. They are sinners because they're not saved. The sin is to reject Christ. Yes. Uh, also, uh, when we do sin, we're serving the devil. We're not supposed to serve him. We're supposed to serve the one that saved us. So, all talking about let me uh, hang on. I got I got to interrupt. Let me say this. Listen, please, for a second. Everybody here has to mute their microphone. Uh, Natalie. Mute yeah. your microphone. Please mute, mute your microphone if you're not talking because you're getting feedback. Did, did Natalie so, want to talk? She was. No, there was feedback coming there. It oh. wasn't her talking. Okay. I was if you, in the background. Yeah. If you yeah. want to talk, then just wave your hands or unmute. But uh, but if you're not talking, you got to mute. Otherwise, we get feedback and you can't understand anything. Okay. All yeah, right. So a lot of people use those verses in First John, you know, to. As if I, I don't understand why they do that. Are they saying they don't sin, so that proves they're saved? Is that I mean, is that why people post those verses? They think because we say that you trying not to sin doesn't save you means that we're telling you to go commit a bunch of sin. Is that what people keep throwing those verses at us for? Because when you trust in God's grace and His free gift of eternal life, it means you're promoting sin. Is that why these verses keep being thrown at me like I've never seen them? I'm, I'm just curious. What do people, what do they do that for? What does that mean? What are they trying to say? That they don't sin anymore? And so therefore they're not of the devil, but I am because I obviously sin. 
Well, Renee, you didn't see my video I made the other day. Uh, uh, he loves me. He loves me not. Did you? No. Okay. You wouldn't be asking that question if you saw my video. It's about well, 10 minutes long, I think. Okay. But it's, it. look, the, the, the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Amen. That is why they're doing that. They're desperate to hold on to their error, and they're, they're full of spiritual pride, pride self-righteousness. They're deceiving themselves. As it says, if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself. They're thinking that they're all, they're all that, but everybody else, uh, you know, you're not doing it. So that's the deception that they're living under, and they refuse to even consider the clear, explicit verses we offer them. Love they, covers they, a lot of sins. And right. I, it, goes in, it goes in one and ear and not the other. To be unloving and uncompassionate and judgmental and self-righteous. When, when, when you tell them a verse that is explicit, that salvation is by faith alone and no works, and it's, it's so clear-cut, it goes in one ear and out the other, and they say, well, what about this verse mm -hmm. in 1 John? If that their heart, that if their heart is evil. They won't <laughs> consider the clear verse that says no works, but they want to say, what about this verse in 1 John? It's an if evil If those heart. verses really hey said that, they would be just as condemned as everyone else. If that's what those verses meant, they would be just as wrong right. as, right. as everybody else would be in. Sis, Renee, they're not tying. What they're doing, okay, when they take the verse, you know, whosoever sins is of their father, the devil, Okay, remember in John chapter 8 when Jesus says, you do not hear my words because you are of your father, the devil. Listen, John 1, 12 says that in order for us to become children of God, we have to believe on Christ, and then we become, we get, we are given the right to become children of God. Anybody in the flesh, when the Bible talks about flesh and spirit in Romans 8, if you look, I think it's verse 13 or verse, it's between right there somewhere, it says, you are not in the flesh if the spirit of God is in you. And so Romans eight flesh versus spirit is talking about lost and saved. First John is talking about lost and saved because before we got saved and before we got our sins forgiven, we were of our father, the devil, we were sinners. And so, um, you know, they don't put two and two together being that when, when first John says, whosoever sins is of the devil. Well, that's, that's all of mankind apart from Jesus. Hey, let me uh, uh, say one thing and then ask Brother Mac, uh, Jack Smack a, a question. Uh, uh, when I listened to Sister Paula's uh, video today that I referenced in the beginning, uh, uh, she, she really did a very good job of, of making the point that how these verses are pulled out of context. I forgot the way she phrased it, but it was really uh, uh, very, very well said. Uh, and they ignore the context not only... Uh, of the verses prior and following the immediate context, but but what's the the setting of the place, uh, the place, the people it's talking to? What's the main message, the intention of the writer at the time, and the overall context of the Bible as a whole? All those things have to be considered. But these people want to pull a verse out to support their position, pull it out of context. And there's a saying that a verse out of context is a pretext, and they do have a pretext. Pretext to me means that there's a there's a, a a willful desire to deceive it's a pretext your your plan is to use it to deceive and that's what they're doing uh so i want to ask jack smack if you've been listening to everything and we're talking about what we would call problem verses the verses the lordship heretics use to try to argue against uh faith alone uh particularly in first john uh, what will you say about the people that keep on throwing first john verses at you brother I mean, anyone who's saying there's a Holy Spirit inside of them, they're not going to believe that they don't sin. It's impossible to believe that if you have the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is letting you know you sin. But the people that want to, you know, insistently throw out verses that are twisted, or that they've mangled, but like, you know, First John 3, 9, yeah, just prove they're not saved. All I have to say about it. Yeah. Okay. All right. I don't okay. know if she could hear that. Kimberly is the one that's posting all the first John. She's been doing it on my channel for a while. I'm hoping she understands. Oh, the that's Kimberly. Between flesh yeah. and spirit, the saint yeah, and the, earth, the saint and Kim the sinner, and it's all the difference is you're either trusting in what Christ has already done for you or you don't. And the one born of God, he cannot sin. 
and uh, your spirit it, it can't sin and your sins in the flesh will never be held against you for eternity. That doesn't mean you don't yeah. have temporal or well, earthly consequences. Okay. Well, I, have a, I have a question for Kimberly and anybody else with the same attitude. Kimberly, uh, you know, I, I, I really hope that you come to uh, believe in faith alone for salvation, but you, you, she makes a lot of comments on my videos and I read the comments and most of the time I approve oh. the comment and uh, make a make a reply, uh, but the comments are routinely this kind of a comment, like she's stating here. Well, what about this verse in First John or something? Arguing against this uh, idea that hey, a person gets saved by faith alone, and uh, they don't have to change their life to prove that they're really saved. Uh, we we. Uh, we we all have our different uh, spiritual growth patterns. Some people grow and mature quickly, some slowly, some don't seem to grow and mature at all. You cannot impose spiritual growth rate chart on everybody universally. Uh, but because Kimberly continues asking these questions all the time, uh, I... I don't know. Jack Smack says, well, that kind of person is clearly not saved. Uh, they're, they're, I don't know what the point is that she's trying to, to make. Uh, my, oh, my point I'm trying to make to Kimberly and anybody else is, look, don't you understand that my channel is uh, a channel that the doctrine is faith alone and Christ alone. No works are required. All, all of us participating here tonight, everybody in this congregation believe that. We even ask if you want to participate in the congregation, read the statement of faith. Um, I agree to the three core doctrines that we uh, are dogmatic, and, and and if you don't agree with them, why do you want to be in a fellowship with people who you think we're, if you think we're all wrong and heretical because we believe in faith alone, why are do you want to be here? Why don't you find a congregation of like-minded people? And another okay. thing is, honestly, the people, the born-again saints that really trust in Christ, they live far better, far better than the people that boast in lordship. Even though we preach you don't have to do anything for salvation. Because you don't. I know they live more godly with more compassion and more care and, and don't uh, vomit their self-righteousness on other people. Hey. They're the kindest, most like Christ-like people I know. And they're the only ones. But the religious, completely different. Dynamics, you'll you'll get there. Dynamics, you'll get a changed life. Yeah, it's it, they're, they're, the whole point is that you know uh, grace is the license to sin. It's just a carnal understanding. They don't get that again. Like Brother Luke said, when you trust in Him and the Holy Spirit, you get the mind of Christ. You start, you love Him. You you serve Him out of love. This seems to be a concept that people just can't seem to get. And exactly, you sister. And you know what? We don't like God's love for you, not how you much love God anyway. We don't like getting uh, chest. We don't like getting taken to the spiritual tool shed. We don't like uh, jumping back in the mud and wallowing in it. It doesn't feel good in our heart. It doesn't That's feel not good. Who we are in our spirit. We've been we've been changed by the spirit of God. And yes, we fail. We fall. We give into the flesh. But but the, we're kept by the power. Of, he gets us back up. He refreshes us. He cleanses us. He strengthens us. And he he, he sure, moves us forward um, each day. And, and and it's like these people just bark at you like, you're a sinner. You're a sinner. You're a sinner. Well, so are you. Listen, what do you do behind? You know, and I hate even getting in that argument about, you know, because in reality, 10,000 sins or 100 sins or 10 sins, one sin is enough to disqualify you from heaven. That's why you have to be under the blood of Christ. Yeah, it's very unfortunate. There, I, I've explained it every every objection that she's had. I, I want her saved. I I don't know why she hates the gospel so much. Well, because they don't. It, it's hard. To, it's hard to grasp. It's really hard to grasp and say, um, you know, like I said, we're hardwired in our flesh to feel like we have to earn, deserve, uh, uh, work hard for, um, you know. They don't it's, realize that it never will be good enough. You will never be good enough. And what you're offering does not help. It's not helping you be saved. Christ did it all. It's blaspheming him to think that he failed at saving any. He said, if you put your trust in him, if you believe on him, he'll save you. And when you say something else is necessary, you're calling him a liar. 
Yep. You're saying that he can't save you. He didn't do enough. His blood was not sufficient. When he offered his blood to the father, the father said, okay, this is good. I'll, I'll take this, but make sure they got to, they got to know they got to keep the law. Also, the law can't justify any, anybody it can only show you how you fail. That doesn't mean we're saying break God's laws with impunity. We love God. We don't want to break his laws. We just know they can't save us. We can't trust in our own righteousness, but God's righteousness by faith in Christ. And if you don't believe the message of the gospel, you can't have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes when you trust in Christ. Yep. Trust Salva salvation is not a reward for the righteous. It's That's a gift right. for the guilty. That's right. That's and, good. It's not and what it you, say, it what you, you know, it kills, it kills me to hear people act like, we genuinely love to just go like, what do you think we're doing? Like just, just living w as wicked as people in the world who don't know Christ. No, we're, what we're saying is, is we are honest with our flesh. We are honest that we struggle. We are honest that we're not sinless. We are honest that we have hurdles, mountains, roadblocks, all types of stuff that we have to climb and we have to depend on Christ and on grace to, for God to even grow us at all. And, and sometimes it takes time. People struggle with different things. People uh, mature much faster than others. But to just come at somebody with all these verses and, and make them feel like they're not good enough for God or they've got to perform for God, you are bringing a different message than what Jesus, Paul, and, and everybody in the Bible brought, which is, you know, to Christ alone. And, and I'm going to tell you this, the truth. You can you can beat down your flesh all you want. You can puff yourself up in self righteousness. You could you could put away all the major sins, and you could walk around thinking you're really holy and that your farts don't stink. But let me tell you something: when you do that, God pulls that rug out from under you, and you come down that really hard fall because pride cometh before a fall. And I'm going to tell you: when God pulls that rug out from under you, you're going to crack your head so hard on the ground, He's going to knock some sense into you, and you're going to realize how far from His standard of perfection you really are. Amen. 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 I, I made a video a, a few weeks ago uh, titled, um, Show Me Your Resume. And I would say this to, uh, um, oh gosh, what was her name again? I uh, forgot. Sorry. The one we're speaking Kimberly. to. Well, Kimberly. Kimberly, yeah. I, I would say this to Kimberly as anybody else that is keeps on making these arguments. Show me your resume. If works are so necessary, give me uh, an account of the works that you're doing every day. It must be very impressive. Do you do you wake up as soon as you wake up? You jump out of bed, work and serving the Lord, and feeding the hungry, and going to visit people in the prisons, and and uh, you you do it exhaustively all day long. And or did you go sell everything you own and give it to the poor, and then go to the Middle East in a mission? No, and, no. You, I, I when I ask people to show me the resume. Give me, tell me the works that you're doing if you think they're so important. Um, and they can't come up with hardly anything. And if they do come up with something, it's laughable that your yeah. works are puny and ridiculous. And you're <laughs> arguing that works are necessary. We're working harder than any of you. And you're the ones that are pointing the finger saying works, works, works. And your works are filthy rags. Ours are filthy rags, too, as far as what God uh, considers for salvation. Brother Luke, I want to tell you something that Renee was saying uh, the other night. Re Renee and I, and, and I'm sure you as well, and other people on the panel, we, we've noticed people in the chat. When people who don't understand the gospel, when they don't understand who they are in Christ, when they don't understand what Christ finished, they they tend to really get a rock-throwing, finger-pointing, oh, I don't sin as much as you type attitude. And there's listen, there's no grace there's no mercy, there's no long-suffering, no meekness. Let me tell you something. A spiritual man and a spiritual woman who has who is at a certain level of maturity that other people are not at. Okay, let's say they don't um, you know, struggle with a lot of sin in their life. Maybe they have a few sins here and there and they and they, but let's say they've gotten to a place where they can, you know, go throughout their day and really walk in the spirit and they don't really give in to the they fight the flesh. They're doing really well. They're very spiritually mature. Those type of people, trust me when I tell you this, they will recognize the struggling, Im more immature believer, and they will go to them in meekness and, and humility. They will not uh, bang them over the head with the Bible and scare them to death. They just wouldn't do it because 
that's a that's the wrong spirit. You know what, my I need to, I, We need to answer a question in the chat room, okay? Okay. Uh, the, the, Can I ask, say this real quick about my pastor? My pastor lives the holiest man I've ever met. Mine he too, sis. <laughs> he didn't hit the woman until he was at the altar of his wedding. He didn't even hold a woman's hand until he married her. He's been married to her his whole life. And he's never drank, never sweat, never did none of these other worldly things. And, you know, he gets accused because he's my pastor, of course. And all he ever says, I'm still a sinner. I still fail. You know, he's aware of it. The more spiritually mature you are, the less you think you're less of a sinner than everybody. There you go. Bingo. You know, it's spiritual immaturity yeah. and a lowering of God's standards of glory. That to, fit your, to fit your to fit your ideal of it. Amen. And Preach it, Hendrick, sister. Hendrix made a good point. He said, those people that get free from all their sin usually get a worse one. It's called pride. Yeah. Let me uh, let me make a, quick, make a quick point and then answer this question here. Uh, let, let us not forget that this uh, program is called Fellowship Friday. Uh, this is supposed to be a fellowship among believers, not arguing with non-believers, lordship heretics. Uh, that's number one. <laughs> and, and number two, uh, the question I have is from Maria Castro. It's kind of funny, but I, I think we should answer it. It says, in all caps, I will dislike you because you don't answer me. <laughs> so the, her question is, uh, uh, I'm not questioning God, but is heaven a real thing? Well, I'll go first on this one because I have a, a, a playlist titled 50 Hours in Heaven. Now, no, I did not die and go up to heaven for 50 hours and come back to tell you about it. That's not what it is. It's a 50-hour study on the subject of heaven. It's 50 hours long. So if you want to know all about heaven, go watch my playlist. Uh, I think Hendrix has gotten almost all the way through it now. I don't know anybody else has watched the whole thing, but... Uh, that I believe the subject of heaven is the most neglected subject in the Bible. Uh, how long could anybody talk here about heaven? Five minutes, 10 minutes? We run out of things to talk about we, because nobody talks about it. But it's also the most joyful subject because that's what our future is, is waiting for us. Uh, so let anybody else go ahead. Is heaven a real thing? Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Heaven's a real place, and I believe it's a physical place, just like the earth is a physical place. I just think it's in other dimensional. It's just in a dimension we don't see, but it's physical. Jesus is flesh and bone. Yeah, there's a literal. <laughs> yeah, literal, it's going to be literal gold streets, literal pearl gates, as the Bible says. I believe these are literal physical that that heaven is physical. It's a, a physical place, just like here. Jesus, well, what are, you're, you're, I, think you're, alone. I believe that you're, you're talking about an intermediate heaven, and then there's a, the eternal heaven, the new heavens and new earth, uh, heaven on earth. So that's that's the physical place. Yeah, I believe we, that's why we have glorified bodies, just like Jesus. He's not a ghost. I mean, he he's a. I believe that spiritual entities like angels and stuff, they have eternal bodies. They're made from a different substance. I, I know they're they're physical though. They're literal. Uh, Natalie, uh, Natalie looks a little bit disgusted with us. Are you are you getting irritated because you're waiting to talk? No. Oh, okay. No. Do you have do you have something to say? Oh, I'm not disgusted. Okay, I, I thought you were waiting Sorry, to say something and you know. couldn't get a word in. So uh, it says here, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, we also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. But in Timothy. Uh, yeah, yeah. If, 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 if we have no faith, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. To me, that's yeah. one of the most important verses in the Bible that tells us that, look, um, uh, there, there are people who say, that you, you cannot lose your salvation, but if you lose your faith, um, you could lose your salvation. Or they'll say, if you lose your faith, it proves you never really had saving faith or you could, couldn't lose your faith. And, and I, I disagree I think, with that point of view. I, I think a person can lose their faith, but 
even though they even though they lost their faith that verse tells us that jesus will remain faithful to keep his promise to us whether we're faithful or not and i illustrate it like, like this here is yeah. that jesus has a hold of me and i have i put my faith in him and we're we're embraced we're connected the holy it's kind of like the holy spirit and my spirit we're one and then uh i i get into sin he what he still has me in the palm of his hand i i i have a, a crisis of faith well, he still has faith, and he's faithful to keep his promise. He won't let go of me. Yeah. Uh, I think what the problem is with people with work sometimes is people try and control themselves, where I think you're supposed to let go of control and let the Holy Spirit and Jesus correct you. You know what I mean? Like, I'm trying to explain. Like, let them fix you rather than you try and fix yourself. Do you understand what I mean? I, I call that surrendering. Now, Yeah, Sister Natalie, what you're talking about when it says, if we endure, we shall reign with him. This is for those. This is a. This is one of the the, the rewards and the uh, possible uh, inheritances that that we can have as believers. If we go on to maturity and if we, uh, you know, faithfully serve in our gifts and talents and things. If we, like Renee said before, there's in the great house. There's vessels of honor and dishonor, and if we purge ourselves from certain things and we go on to be a vessel of honor, uh, we will have uh, certain responsibilities as reigning with Christ in the millennial kingdom. I believe that, and I think so. I'm not saying that some people are going to be disqualified, but they may not have the same position or they may not have the same responsibility. But if we, uh, you know, if we uh, endure, and, and and you know, it says that we can reign with Christ. That's a privilege. That's a reward. Um, it doesn't keep us out of heaven if we don't, because in the very next verse says, if we, uh, you know, become faithless, he remains faithful as brother Luke said. And then it says, if we deny him, he will deny us. Well, people who put their trust on Christ and been saved, we don't deny him. We may lose faith for a time or we may lose faith, but God remains faithful. And if we do endure and go on to, uh, purge ourselves of certain things, become a vessel of honor, we can have the privilege of reigning with Christ, co-reigning with Christ. It's a, it's a type of inheritance, uh, as far as I understand it, but the, the, so it basically gives you watch this. It basically gives you three examples of people. The first example is the one who goes on to maturity, purges themselves of certain things, becomes a vessel of honor, gets a privilege of, of co-reigning with Christ in the millennial kingdom. The second one is the believer who may struggle or become faithless at times, yet God still keeps them saved. The third one is the one who denies him and rejects Christ and isn't saved to begin with. Yeah. I, that verse, when he it says that um, he will... If we deny him, he will deny us. That's talking about service. He will deny us service, or he will deny us as being servants, but denying us in terms of saving us, he will never do that. Yeah, once he's right. saved, he's never going to de deny. That whole thing is if you deny uh, the what he's asking you to do, then he will deny you the reward. The whole thing yeah. is about Yeah, service. I think that's the whole thing's a reward thing because in that very chapter, I think it uh talks about the vessels of honor and dishonor. Yeah, it is. The whole that's the whole context of it. But yet they're but, still um, both in the never trust Christ and they deny him. Well, he will deny him before the Father. But that's a whole separate issue. That that's somebody rejecting him. Uh but I you know there's some people claiming they used to believe and now they're atheists. Every atheist I've heard that they, they all had a different gospel. Yeah. They, they yep. yep. Repent of your sins or something. Uh, or works. If they did claim the right gospel, I think once God convinces <laughs> you and you're his, you might get mad at God. You might backslide. You might turn away from God, but I don't believe that you would ever deny his existence again. Like, I don't think that could happen because the Holy Spirit bears witness to truth in us. So I would say that person probably never really believed. They may have just have been somebody smooth had talked them into it or something, but they weren't convinced. Like they, or they were, or they were, you know, coming to God to try it out and they're yeah, waiting for right, their, right. they're waiting for their health and their wealth and their prosperity. <laughs> but only God knows, only God knows. Right. Well, only that's, a, that's the kind of thing that we cannot make a judgment about, right. but uh, I, I'm inclined to believe that, uh, that the person, um, uh, uh, could very well, uh, not, 
not uh, believe at all anymore, uh, even though they have the Holy Spirit, because the Bible does tell us that the Holy Spirit wants to transform us. See, Natalie, you're asking about uh, giving over control. There's a false gospel message that to get saved, you have to surrender your life over to Jesus. That's a false gospel. But it is true and it is wise that once we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, that we have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to transform our minds and we have a choice to, to respond to the Spirit's promptings or resist it. If we resist it, it grieves the Spirit. If we continue resisting, we can tune it out and we've quenched the spirit. And I think with the quench, we quench the spirit, and it could be the case, Renee, that this person actually even loses faith in God's existence if they've quenched the spirit. That could be possible. There are some. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think it's possible, but every person that so far, every person so far that I've seen, like there's this atheist guy that goes around and does. Uh, debates Christians and claim to have been a pastor in the past. He had a repent of your sin. And the reason I know he had a wrong gospel is because he said, well, I just, I'm not going to believe that you don't live good enough that he's just going to throw you in a burning hell. That's not the gospel at all. So I don't even know why he was a pastor or claimed yeah. to be a Christian. That, that unfortunately, that unfortunately happened recently to somebody I was close to. They, they could not bring themselves to put faith alone and I mean they tried they were even on your channel for a long time Renee they tried but they just were they had so many um you know workspace people in their ear and in their circle and in the church they went to that they just couldn't it was a tug of war and I think they tried but I don't think they ever got themselves to that to that revelation they gave up but let's just pray the Lord started to work on her you want to I think he might bring it out okay Right. Uh, Renee, Renee, uh, you know that's this is anecdotal, and it, you can't really put a lot of confidence in anecdotal. Like you don't, the people you know that became atheists, they didn't, they didn't believe the real gospel. Uh, I, I can give you two names right now of people who claimed, uh, and I, I don't know, I, but they claimed to believe the real gospel. They worked closely with me for a year, uh, probably about five or six years ago. Mm -hmm. They are atheists they, now. Yeah, they became uh, atheists, even even anti-theists. They well, became only, uh, God knows if they're his. They, they hated they hated the gospel and uh, and I mean they hated the Bible and but the God of the Bible. That's how far they went. One has since come back. I think maybe both have come back. But Praise they, God. They did. Uh, I, I think he'll always bring us back to the truth. I do. If, yes, if we if we at one point truly received uh, his sealing of his Holy Spirit. We can run and we can hide, but we're eventually going to come back. Go ahead, Brother Luke. Yeah, I, I'm just saying that. So there, I, I believe there are people that uh, they uh, there's two examples I could name that these people sure. were passionate. They were working with me. They understood the gospel as well as we do. And they, they professed faith in this gospel. And then shocking to me and everybody who knew them. They're atheists and they're not only atheists, but working hard against us all. And now. One of them is back with us actively a lot of, a lot of the time. And, uh, and the other one, uh, I heard uh, them uh, say that they're a believer again, but they're not. I don't see them on YouTube, but I do. Right. Well, I, I was informed that they're believers again. Uh, so only God knows, though, doesn't he? I mean, yeah. only God knows. Yeah, we, don't, we don't know, but I'm no. just saying, uh, in this case, this is another anecdotal examples of people who claimed they, they knew the real gospel, they claimed they believe it, then they became atheists, even anti-theists, mm -hmm. and then now the, now they're back saying they believe again. So uh, it, it, I think it is possible, but we can't How can judge. you believe and not believe? We how can't. Can how can you believe and not believe? <laughs> how can you do that? Believe and then how not can believe. I, how can I answer that question? How, I don't know how it happens, but it does, I think. But other people say, no, it can't happen. I get bad thoughts sometimes. I get upset and I feel like I'm judging God. Yep. Why do you let that happen? Or well, this doesn't make sense to me in the Bible. I think this is wrong. I get like that. But I also remember mm -hmm. that I'm I'm just the clay and his ways are higher than my ways and I try to accept it. But I okay. get thoughts and if I follow through with him, Brother Luke, I could easily walk away from God. I can yeah. do that. Okay, let me get let me answer Natalie this way. Yeah, I was like that tonight. I was thinking, 
I was questioning God in a certain way. I was saying, why did why did he hate Esau and like Jacob? Because Jacob wasn't perfect. But then someone said it's because Esau feared God. I mean, no, sorry, Jacob feared God. Where Esau didn't. That has but, nothing to do with like salvation, though. That was what when it says Jacob I loved, Esau I hated, he's talking about the nations of yeah. Edom and Israel. Uh okay. Jacob becomes Israel and he loved him, meaning he chose him for the savior to be born through his bloodline. Okay, yeah, what, is, yeah. what do you think what do you think is the most dangerous person thing that a person can do? I'll tell you, since you would never guess. Go to college. I cannot tell you how many people raise their children and they these people their, their children are passionate believers. They understand the gospel, they believe it, they love Jesus, they go to college and they succumb to the peer pressure and Amen. The, the, Amen. the brainwashing of the of, of the colleges are nothing but atheist factories. 85% of Christians that go to universities lose their faith in their freshman year. Yeah. So, Natalie, that's, to answer your question, that's how people can believe and then not believe. They they go and get brainwashed by the authorities, the the intellectuals, yeah. the scientists, and, and told and told that they're foolish. I was to told by the fairy tales. Support worker what? that I can't teach my children about Christianity; that I shouldn't force them. That's what I was told, um, and I should let them. Let my daughter believe in Santa. Who gave you? Let me ask you this: Who gave you that wisdom? It was a, a family support worker that I. I uh huh. You, well, you know what? Worldly wisdom don't stand in the counsel of the ungodly. Because I'm just God thinking, if I was a Muslim, she would not say that. Yeah, because the Bible says you train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's older, he will not depart from it. Yeah, it's my child at the end of the day. That's right. If I don't want my child to believe in Santa Claus. It's up right. to me. It's my it. child. Why, why are you listening to secular guidance? That's what I'm saying. Don't stand That's in the good. council of the ungodly. They will always tell you, you shouldn't bring up your children in religion. I've had people tell me I'm a terrible mother for bringing my son up, uh, believing in the Bible and all that garbage. I've had a lot of people say that to me. But God's word says to raise your children in the fear of the Lord. Tell them how to walk in his ways. So the whole book of Ecclesiastes and Proverbs is instruction to his son. So the, the Bible tells us we should train up our children the way they should go. And when they're older, they won't depart from it. I've so got a video on my YouTube because there, it, you know, uh, there's a cartoon called Teo, the ma little book, magic boss or whatever it is. It's got um, a witchcraft on it. So I've exposed it on my channel. Uh, the boy with the orange sweatshirt is wearing a um, a cult symbol on his T-shirt, and that's supposed to be educational for children. So I've warned parents on it. So I don't know if many have seen it. Not to let the children watch Teo the Little Boss because there is witchcraft on it. So, yeah, there's books now. Uh, witchcraft for children, witchcraft for preteens, witchcraft for teenagers. There's books written just for them to learn witchcraft. I know it's terrible. You know, Satan's horrible is trying to hit kids. Well, yeah, they're yeah. making little dolls, witch dolls, paranormal dolls. Yeah, there's Ouija uh, tarot cards, Ouija boards. Yeah. Will you go to bed? Sure. Sorry. <laughs> I was talking to my teenager. It was just we're, being we're, a bit naughty. Brother Luke said the same thing I was thinking. Why would you listen to ungodly counsel? Yeah. 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 This it's is the, it's because this is, the, this is the owner's manual for your life, Natalie. Yeah. This is where you go for all your answers. Don't go to secular counselors, psychologists, and all that. Yeah. Yeah, all these uh, schools and all that, they're a bit manipulative and stuff like that. I mean, I had a bit of a problem about two years ago. I had like a spiritual attack and stuff like that. And they said it was a psychotic episode. 
So I, my children had to go and live with my mum and I had social services involved and that's why I've got a family support worker at the moment. It, I threw a Santa Claus cookie jar in the bin and stuff like that and, you know, I don't, it was kind of horrible. So, you know. And you know, sometimes, sometimes my wife uh, reads my mind and I tell her that I think she has psychotic powers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's got ESPN. Psychotic yeah. powers. <laughs> A lot of these people don't believe that all these things are real. They just think it's mental illness and stuff like that. They don't understand. Oh, boy. They always try to say that everything's... Can you hear me? My sister's got voices in her head and uh, they put uh, her on medication. But that's not going to help her because it's demons that's yeah. in her head. Okay, Caleb, we, we do hear you, but all along, all the time, every time you speak, it, it's faint. It's not a, it's not a strong, uh, Very low. Loud, loud. Very low. Okay. If you can get closer to your microphone or do something, it'd be better. I'm on my iPad, so yeah, yeah. maybe. Yeah, but, okay. Yeah, people really do like to deny that stuff like this does exist. I even warn people about this, and they don't believe me. They can't hear me. Like, for example, people playing with Ouija boards, I tell them, do not play with that stuff. Because once you play with that stuff, it's, it's very hard to get rid of it. I've seen a show where this woman burned a Ouija board and the Ouija board came back. She even broke it in half and it still came back. And I'm like, you uh, open a portal whenever you do that. Even if you remove the object, the portal is open. You have open the door between dimensions for these entities to come through. Exactly. You can't and I'm like, close it. I mean, it's hard. You can, did, but it's hard. Did everybody see the movie The Exorcist? Of course. That, yeah, that was, yeah, that was yeah. the scariest. It was the scariest movie I ever saw. Me too. I can never too. watch it again. And, and and I didn't that all start with her playing with a Ouija board? Yep. Yep. No, it came no. through. The demon came through as Captain Howdy. <laughs> Friend. Well, Captain I'm gonna Howdy. I'm gonna give a little testimony real quick. I had a sick um, I had a sick fascination with that movie. I watched that movie like a thousand times, and I used to laugh at it. it never, I went it, to the theater <laughs> and saw the director's re-release in the '90s. Yeah, I I followed every Exorcist movie, but that original one, man, that's some that you know, and I I never in my life thought you know I thought I thought it could possibly be real, and I wasn't sure. But, you know, a couple of years in the ministry, you get called into certain places and you begin to see certain things and, and it just all rings a bell. And it's like, wow, you don't want to play with that stuff. Attached to that movie, brother. To there were honest. real demons attached to that film. It was too real. I'm telling you, there was demons attached <laughs> to that thing. Too I, real. I, know, I met her a few times, Linda Blair. It destroyed her life. She never had a career again. Have you met her? Yeah. Wow. Course. Well, to be honest, I've watched that movie. To be honest, it really didn't scare me. Now, there's some demonic movies that do, you know, get me a little bit. There, there's some I'm like, yeah, that's not scary. But if I saw that in real life, I would be horrified. Well, it was the mind games the demon played. The yeah. mind games. Yeah. Like when he used the voice of the homeless man, it's like, oh my gosh, is this thing following me everywhere? You know, like when it used the voice of the, and it used his mother's voice, and it was all the mind games that was so horrific. But the reason I hate that film is because it makes it seem like the devil has victory and the power of Christ has nothing. Right. Because he, he lost. He lost to the devil. It yeah. killed the priest. But, I mean, a Catholic priest isn't born again anyway. But, uh, you know, uh, Jesus spoke calmly and commanded him to go and they had to go there was no weeks and weeks of fighting and you know you know renee what's interesting about that is how you made that point remember the uh sons of skiva that went to go use jesus name and the yes. demons just beat the crap out of them yes, and ripped their did. clothes off and send them off bloody that's right he said he said wait a minute paul we know and jesus we know but who are you they yeah. should have they should have sent bob larson to them right right uh, <laughs> this that i saw a video of him one time it got on my nerves and i made a comment saying if that was a real demon that demon would most likely kill him 
<laughs> yeah, there's a lot. Chris Lasala does these too, and he'll go, "You never seen a real Christian like me with power, have you?" Oh my goodness! I wish I would have done that to an actual demonic. Person. And the people are playing along. My name's Legion. That's the only demon name you know from the Bible, obviously. Everybody tries to pretend. Oh, it's just so horrific. If it was, I, right? I, if I, it was, I know it. I mean, through discernment, I know that those people are not possessed. Yeah. Utter, utter nonsense. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, Absolutely. And then they're trying to tear. Then they're trying to terrify the demons. I'm like, demons are not scared of us. They'll laugh at us if we try right. to them. And uh. Natalie, uh, you were talking about she hears voices. I believe a lot of mental illness is demonic oppression. I Some of it. Some of it's physical. But, uh, uh, for instance, they had a man, a born-again Christian, went into this mental institution for a while. And all, and these people were so criminally insane. They, they couldn't, I mean, they were out of their minds. And uh, he was, visited there for like a month. And he would go in. He first just started singing Jesus Loves Me. And that they all started singing it. And he would go in there and he would preach Jesus' love to him. And, like, they were completely sane after a month. There was only, like, two or three that didn't recoup, recover. And now, religion's not allowed to be brought into a mental place anymore. You can't bring religion. Like, priests can't come in. Pastors can't come in. Nobody's allowed into a, a psycholo um, yeah. psychological ward anymore. Yeah. One thing I don't like is when you get these... You know these like Nigerian videos with these fake exorcisms? Yep. You know the yep. fake ones? Yep. Where it yep. says I am Lucifer and all stuff like that. Yep. It's like no. Emmanuel TV. Emmanuel yeah, that's TV. it. Fake ones like that. Yeah, that, really really that would take a lot more than just that to get him yes, out. Yes, Billy yeah. would know if there's a lot yeah. of the charlatans and fake exorcisms out there. Yeah. He's in he's in Nairobi, Kenya. He wouldn't know about it if that's going on there. Mm -hmm. Billy, uh, yeah, thank you. Because what I, I, I've experienced, right, people say it was a psychotic episode, but Lucifer can possess a child and an animal. It's not like the other demons. Yeah, let's, let's, let, let's let Billy answer, but first of all, well, Lucifer... I believe, is, I, I believe I've met him. Don't, in, don't, don't uh, think that you're so special that the devil himself is worried about you. Right. The devil is not right. omnipresent like God is. The devil is not everywhere. He can only be one place at one time. I don't yeah. think he's singling out Natalie. You're not Sorry, much. Sorry, I didn't mean it that way. So you may you may have some de demons. I'm just saying he can possess children not the devil and himself. animals. Let's give Billy a chance to t tell us about what's going on there in Africa. That girl got killed, didn't she? That one who got possessed. What was that girl, Amelia? She got killed Natalie, because the priest Natalie, couldn't Natalie, him. Natalie, can you yeah. hear me? We, we, we want to let Billy talk. Hang on. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, don't worry about it. Um, as in, we're in Africa, so it's it's just it's closer to us. Like, um, it's not far from our culture and tribe to have other stuff going on so maybe that's why you know such stuff like even christianity sometimes they combine it with um tribal stuff and you know once you combine that once you combine that you miss everything so yeah like it should always just be jesus plus nothing calls everything well, like in voodoo way. they mix the african gods yeah. with catholicism yeah and so, so it, it all just becomes witchcraft yeah uh it horrifies me it when it gets it just horrifies me when true believers are involved in that stuff and they get it worse well yeah because the devil's just waiting to pounce on them right yep that's what well I, uh, you should read the book by c.s lewis uh screw tape letters the, it's an it's a novel it's a story but it's about the spiritual battle and it's very, very interesting. And I think he probably uh, uh, understands what's going on pretty well. So read Screw Tape Letters. Beat by C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis. I love him. I love the Chronicle of Narnia movies. It's very dangerous. I want to say something here. 
it's very dangerous to say all mental illness comes from the demonic. Do not do that. And here's why. Because people condemn these people that have chemical. I have chemical depression. I've had it my whole life. I have been hospitalized for it. I suffered as a child. I could be walking and all of a sudden a dread would fall on me and I couldn't move for days. Just couldn't get up. Now, since I have stopped taking medication, it's been about five years, I stopped sleep meds, I stopped anti-anxiety meds, and I stopped depression meds. But that was because I knew it was time. Not because I was condemned, not because it was a sin to take my medicine, but because I knew it was time. I felt my spirit, it was the right time, it was what I needed to do, and I had my reasons. But you should never tell somebody that it's not real because mental illness can be chemical, physical, and it's a result of fallen flesh. It's a sickness like any other sickness. It is not right. a sin to take medication. There are people, John MacArthur said this mess to people, and they ended up committing suicide. So you should never tell people that God's condemning them for taking medication, ever. Plus. I have disabled people that are condemned. They live in horrible pain like me, and mm -hmm. I admit, I suffer enough and I'm condemned for taking my own medication. And that's why I have so many disabled and chronically ill and chronic pain people on my channel because they can't go anywhere else without being condemned. They suffer enough. That's so right. Can, can, I ask Sister, can I ask Sister Lisa in the in the chat room? Lisa, I just posted the link. Uh, if you're, if you're uh, able, uh, join us. The link to join is posted right there in the chat room. So Lisa, go ahead and join us if you're able, okay? But yeah, even true believer, and saying that a mental illness is nothing but demonic, even true believers are who have mental illnesses are thinking that they're demonic possessed. I'm like, come on uh, now. Yes, there are some demons when they possess an unbeliever, they do make you see stuff. They they do, but come on, like condemning true believers that have that. And making them think that they're demonic. It's horrifying. Yeah, Pete, when you wake when you wake up in pain and you go to sleep in pain and you can't get comfortable and it's you you're supposed to be of sound mind. And if a yeah. doctor gives you something and it allows you some bit of quality of life. I mean, we tell somebody dying of cancer, they're not allowed to take their pain meds. It's the same thing with chronic pain people. They're not doing it to get high. They don't even, I don't even feel my medication. I take two pills a day and they're time release, but it allows me quality of life. It allows me to get the walk. But some of my viewers, they get so condemned. They're already miserable. They're already in pain every day. Their whole lives are messed up. They're financial, social, emotional everything pain affects your whole life they suffer enough and then you got people condemning them for it it is the worst thing you can do to someone it's so uncompassionate and especially with mental illness some people need that medication to make them chemically balanced thank you sister i was just going to try to testify to that real quickly um i won't be long uh, for about 13 years, I, uh, I, I wrestled with um, severe panic disorder, agoraphobia. Like I literally got boxed in my house. Like I, I could, I could only go literally to the corner store. I could literally only go maybe a mile or two away, and it was getting so bad. I was ending up in the hospital. I thought something was really wrong with me. I uh, went to church. Like I said, I, I, you know, I came up in the Pentecostal church. So they tried to pray it out. They tried to pray over me. They tried to do this. They tried to do that. It actually, they made it it got worse it seemed after that like like it's like the enemy picked up on it and it was just coming at me full force so i fought it and fought it and fought it for about 11 years uh finally i just got down on my knees and i said god and, and i'm gonna tell you from the church i was in i was deathly afraid to go to the doctor and get medicine because i thought i didn't have enough faith i thought uh you know i was not trusting god and i was just really ignorant to some really false teaching and this is why i'm i'm so adamant against certain uh denominational teachings this day long story short i got on my knees i prayed to god i said god i need peace and directions I, I i can't keep going to the hospital i gotta go further than a mile out of my house i was you know i'm a big guy i'm six foot three i'm a big dude i should not be afraid to go further than a mile from my house like 
I, back in the day, I used to get in like, you know, gunfights and knife fights and gang fights. And I, I was never afraid. Like I literally was so crippled with fear that I couldn't leave my house. And so I prayed about it. And I told, I told God, I said, you need to give me peace and direction. And, you know, I was flipping through an old number, um, you know, my old book with numbers in it. And I came across my old primary care doctor and I decided to give him a call. I went to the doctor. He, he diagnosed me right away with a uh, severe panic disorder and agoraphobia. He gave me, I mean, right away, I got lucky. I got a good diagnosis. I got the right medication. And literally within a month, I, I was, it, it just lifted off me. And I felt so much peace from God. I was not condemned. I had no conviction. It was like, I almost felt like God was saying, what did you wait so long for? Okay. Uh, I, uh, Lisa, you're saying you can't find the link. I posted it numerous times in the chat, and I just emailed it to you. Lisa, check your email, if, and uh, I sent it there, but I, it's in the chat. I'll put it in again right now in the chat. And, my, and nice person, I'm not ignoring you. I don't see the chat a lot. I'm hosting the show. I'm trying to make sure everybody's getting a chance to talk, and I'm not seeing the chat as it goes by. I go back and re-scroll it. So I'm not ignoring you. I didn't even see your comment. Yeah, is there a, someone, uh, I think Darlene said there's someone trying to ask a question. So post it right now in all caps. I'll, I'll uh, post your question in all caps if you think we missed your question, and I'll look for it, and then we'll try to answer it. Yeah, Lisa's going to join us. Awesome. For the most high Jesus. Oh, by the way, uh, uh, I was talking about uh, Sister Paula earlier the, here, the Bible literalist. Uh, I did an interview of her uh, on last night. And uh, if you didn't see that, you should check out that interview of uh, Sister Paula. Okay, so nice person says, I wish I was as good as Renee Rowland. What does that mean? I don't claim to be good. I'm not good. Jesus is good. I'm not. I don't know what you mean by that. Oh, I wish I was as good as Renee. I don't know what that means. What does that mean? What? What, what was your question? Did you need me to help? If I can, I'll help. I don't know everything, but I can try. Uh, I'm trying to see. Um, Hendrix. Uh, what, what was the question? Hendrix, was there something this person needed? Because I, I, I thought you were ignoring me. No, honey, I, I'm not ignoring you. I'm, just, I'm trying to do a lot of things at once. So if, if you do have a question, I, I can try to answer. Hey, sis, how you doing? She's no, that's, no that's, that, that's, that's still Natalie. Oh, okay. All right. I thought I'd miss somebody coming in. So I'll, I'll look for a nice person's question, but I can't find it yet. I think they need to re-ask it, uh, sis, because I, I scrolled back trying to find it, and I couldn't find this specific question. Just try to have them re-ask it. Okay. You're welcome, nice person. If, if I can help you, I will. If You you know, it's funny. It's question. funny. The, the, the title, nice person, um, it reminds me of this. Um, my, I have an old friend who used to be my best friend. But even the best of friends, someone that you uh, uh, really think of almost like a son, and you lead him, I led him to the Lord, and he joined my home Bible study. He attended my home church for seven years, and uh, and then he ended up getting mad at me about a, a theological position I took. And we haven't talked for years now, uh, but he, uh, uh, wow, why did I say that? Uh, <laughs> I forgot why I was saying there was something about something in the chat room I was going to relate that to. Um, all right, maybe I'll think of it in a minute. Pardon me. I'll be 69 pretty soon. I'm losing it. <laughs> I don't think you ever had it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're not the only one. Yeah. Hey, Brother Dave, I told Luke his brain's like a sponge, but somebody ran it out. Uh, hey, uh, <laughs> Renee, 
All right, I got the question. I got the question, Brother Luke. What? He what? said, nice person me... said, go ahead, Luke, oh, you see the question? Now I remember the nice person. That was what I was talking about, okay? Oh. Let me finish my point now. <laughs> uh, the, t this guy, his name is Tony, and he used to always ask people, uh, are you going to go to heaven? Are you certain you're going to go to heaven and why? And they'd always say, yeah, I, I think so. I'm a, I'm a pretty nice person. And so – this became like an ongoing joke because almost everybody answers the question, well, I think I'm going to go to heaven. I hope I am. And why? Well, because I'm a nice person. And so I'm wondering if this person, nice person, is making a play on that premise there that uh, people think that they're a nice person and that's why they get to go to heaven. Uh, so uh, what's the question? The question that nice person was asking is, what are some scriptures that you recommend for somebody who's backslidden very far and is trapped in a lot of sin? Uh, well, it depends on what verses you're trying to do. Are you trying to remind them of who Jesus says they are in him? If you're trying to, or are you trying to correct their behavior? Are you trying to warn them that there's... I think, I think what he's saying, sis, I think what he's saying is he doesn't quite know how to come back to Christ or walk closer. He's so far like... He's okay. so far trapped in sin. He's so far backslidden. What are some encouraging scriptures to, to push him closer to Christ? Okay, well, for one thing, if you ever trusted in Christ, he will never leave you or forsake you. So he hasn't gone anywhere. It's you running away from him. And if you run right back to him, he's just going to, with open arms, you know, as a matter of fact, when the sheep, carries, he picks them up, puts them over his neck and carries them on his shoulders. He doesn't forsake yeah. him. He carries the weight. So um, you you need to abide in his love and know who he said he made you to be. And that he's not going to condemn you. He, he paid your sin debt. So and he wants the best for you. So if you've if you've backslidden and you're feeling distant from him, just come back to him. He's he's not, it'll he wants to save you from the temporal earthly consequences. That comes from sin because sin destroys us. It gives the devil a, an open door. Uh, it, you know, like when 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 the Satan asked God if he could sift Peter like wheat for for denying, he knew that he would deny Christ the, that same day. And and Jesus warned him. You know, Satan uh, asked if he could sift you like wheat, but I've prayed for you. So um, that's that. The main thing is to know who you are. And how much God loves you, who he says he made you to be. And then he hasn't left you. Yes, he, he hasn't left you. Mm -hmm. If that's what the issue is. I'm sorry, Natalie, sister, you said you needed something. Um, I thought I remember that. What's backsliding? Uh, it's just when we walk away from our fellowship. You know, oh, right. You know, like Another. some people, if they were alcoholic and they got themselves cleaned up once they were saved, they fall back in alcoholism or porn addiction or whatever. Backsliding, the, you know, people usually associate backsliding with fleshly habits. Can you be saved if you smoke? I smoke. All right. Because <laughs> that's one I think I struggle with smoking. That's, I mean, it's flesh is flesh. It's not good for me. You know what the consequence of smoking is? Bad health. And back to it has nothing to do with being saved or unsaved. You know, it's just right. that all things are lawful, but not all things are good for me. You know, but uh, you know, there up until recently, smoking wasn't even considered a sin. Uh, Spurgeon smoked cigars. You know, that lady that stalked me, she condemned me. She did a huge campaign against because I admit I smoke. I tell people the truth about me. I'm not some holy one. I'm not a pastor. I don't have standards to live up to. But she, I said, well, Spurgeon smoked. Well, that was cigars. That's different. It's like, this is how legalistic. Are you talking about Karen Reed? Yes. Yeah. Does she still stalk you? Has yes, she, she does. She's the one that got my, uh, my chant, the, the link when people were trying to raise money to help me get my mouth surgery. She got it shut down. Oh, yeah. oh! She's still she's still doing that. That's not right Anytime now. somebody tries to help me, she makes sure that she shuts it down. Yep, still doing it. That's terrible. That, that's cool. Christians are best to show love, aren't we? Not things like that. There's a 
uh, uh, somebody was struggling in the chat with uh, they believe that they feel like their heart is getting hard and they feel like um, it, they're not really feeling anything uh, positive or negative. They're just kind of stuck in a numb state. And so I just want to give them a little recommendation of encouragement, just maybe, you know, 10 or 15 minutes a day alone with God. You don't have to do nothing eloquent. You don't have to put on a show because the Lord searches the reins of our hearts anyway. So just get down, talk to God and just open up to him. Be real with him. Tell him what you're struggling with. Tell him what your uh, fears are. Tell him what you're worried about, what's stressing you. Speak with him and open up your heart to him and just be real and honest with him and just, you know, spend that alone time with him. And eventually, as you as you get in and in, in sit before the Lord, uh, he will begin to soften your heart again. He will begin to refresh in your spirit again. And I want to use uh, back in Psalms, there was a uh, I think it's Psalm 70 something. Uh, there was a person um, I forget his name. It starts with an A, but uh, he was uh, becoming really vexed and he was becoming really hardened and really stressed at what was going all around him. But in the middle of the chapter, it says that he went into the sanctuary of God, or meaning he got into his secret place alone with God and began to share his fears, share his doubts, share his concerns with God with an open, honest heart. And it says in that time, the Lord brought a refreshing upon him. And so I think if you are feeling your heart getting hard, you just want to get alone with God, open up with him, be real and, and, and share all your fears, concerns, worries, struggles. He already knows them anyway. And, and I think he's longing, um, you know, for that fellowship. Uh, Kimberly said she quit smoking too on the patch. Yeah, I, I, um, I'm doing the vape now. I still have a cigarette every now and then because it's not enough nicotine because I've got a real low uh, nicotine thing. And, uh, uh, I'm trying to quit off the cigarettes. I've moved to vape and I keep lowering the nicotine amount so I can get down on it. It's taken some time, but I've smoked since I was 12 years old. Yeah, wow. I was 12 when I started. So, <laughs> I've smoked a long time and I actually like it. So I mean, I don't feel condemned. Like I'm saying, so I'm I think it hurts my testimony though. Because uh, some religious people think it, you know, it's wrong. My Sometimes. pastor knows I smoke. I don't hide it from him. I even told I'm a member, a standing member of my church. And I told him flat out when I joined the church, I said, well, if, if this is a problem for you, I'm just going to tell you up front. I have cigarettes. Don't feel like quitting them right now. And I had an hour long theological discussion. He said, well, if the Lord's revealed that much of the scripture to you, it, you got to be saved. So <laughs> he said, I, I hope that you get free from it, but we're not going to condemn you or keep you out of my church because of it. To so, be honest, even yeah. 19. I sometimes think about, you know, wanting to try a little wine. Okay, yeah, I know I'm young, but I'm almost 20. And it says in Proverbs somewhere, I don't know what it is, that you can have wine anyway. As long as you don't yeah, drink. That wine makes a merry heart. You know, if you do it in moderation, there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah, you just have to be careful you don't get drunk. Because be you can't drink. Yeah. That's the problem. Yeah, because yeah. I've, I've never drank, I never smoked. I, I mean, but. I want. I just. I, I'm thinking when I turn either 20 or 21, I just want to try a little wine. Not well, to the, the strength of sin is the law. So the more you condemn it and make it forbidden, the more you want it. You know. I, I never condemned it. I was. Yeah. Sure. I, yeah. There's far less wanna... alcoholics in the European world, and they're they're not all weird about alcohol over there. Yeah, I'm not weird about it, but. I just want to, you know, just to try a little taste, just to know what it's like. And you know what's cool about that, Caleb, brother Caleb? Like, say you and I went out to dinner, me being a former uh, very intense alcoholic, I would I would pass on the wine, but I would be totally cool with you having a glass or two of wine, and I would not, I would not you know, some, some people say, like, oh, you're causing me to stumble, or, you know, you're making me want to drink again, but I'm past that point. But now let's say somebody went out to dinner with us, and they were like, oh, man, you know, I'm, I'm getting these urges to go back to drink. Then, you know what I mean? Then you would probably want to just wait on the wine and, you know what I mean, take it into the comfort of your own home. But, I mean, I don't understand why people condemn people for that. It, the Bible says do not be a drunkard. 
which means you're drinking yourself into a, a altered state of mind on a continual basis to have a glass of wine or to have a mixed drink or to have a thing. You know, some people are really adamant against it. I'm not one of those people. Like, I'm an ex-alcoholic, and, and you know, I go out you to dinner with the— You know what's for you. You know it's a personal weakness for you. Right, and yeah. I just had to let it go, and I asked right. God to take it, and he took it. But, you know, we go out with the men's meetings for the, the guys at my church, and we go out to have dinner or something, and a couple of those guys order wine. It doesn't bother me a bit. Yeah, when— uh. I don't, I don't like to drink either. It, it kind of, cause you know, I, I struggle with chemical depression. Alcohol makes you more depressed. But when I was uh, away, when Joseph visited, we went up to DC. I was really stressed and grieved because I had didn't have my Bible. I wasn't in fellowship. I was like, I felt horrible. And I actually had a couple martinis. I never drink. And I did that. I couldn't. I so like, as soon as I got home, Joseph saw it. As soon as I got home and it was fellowshipping that Sunday night. With Brother Luke and everybody, my spirit lifted. So, and even he was amazed by it. He was like, for a couple of days, you were so down, and I was kind of quiet, and I was just, uh, I drank alcohol, and I hardly ever do that. But that, I mean, the world grieves me, and so uh, you know, I don't condemn it. If I wanted a martini, I'd have one. I just don't. I just, they, they, it just makes me feel tired, and it makes me depressed. But I wouldn't condemn anybody for it. Well, my me, it's a sin to even drink fermented drinks. In the, in the chat room, uh, someone says, well, what about pornography once in a while? No, uh, I would no, 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 no. That's I, completely I would, different. Oh, no, I would no, caution no. Uh, Caleb. Caleb, you're, you're, you've been talking about how you're curious and you'd like to experience some wine just to see what it's like. And uh, I, I would caution anybody, whether it's – Me too. Uh, Alcohol or drugs or pornography or gambling, all oh, these things are very, very addictive for certain people. I uh, some know. people do not have a, an addictive uh, personality. Other people, as soon as you start it, you end up being addicted and you're, yep, you're, yep. And it's going to be a struggle your whole life. I advise right. people, if you unless you've already done it, and, and don't get do something out of curiosity right. and because it could take control of your life. I I've agree. I that. think that's great advice. I think that's great advice. I'm already struggling with something. I don't want to say what it is on the live chat, but I'm already struggling with an addiction. Yeah. I hate it. I I've struggled with it for some odd years, but even yeah, I I hate it. It what? that remember yesterday, Renee, when I told you that it makes me go into a little depression sometimes because yeah. it grieves the Holy Spirit. It's that one. Okay. Yep. Well, I want to warn against the porn thing. There's a big difference between somebody having a glass of wine at dinner and watching porn. Porn is flat out sin. It's lust. It does nothing but encourage fornication and yeah. lustful thoughts. It's not good. It's sinful. I hate it's it. horrific. It's it's different because yeah. somebody asked it in the in the chat room. This isn't to condemn you, but no, it's not okay in a little while because it'll become an addiction. Like Brother Luke said, I have never seen somebody watch porn and not be consumed by it. Yeah. Even women get consumed. Man, I, I put myself out there like I did on the other show, sis. Brother Caleb, whoever's struggling, listen, it's okay to be honest. I Look, I struggled almost, I would say, a good three years. I did. I was so deep into pornography because I was like, oh, well, I'm a man of God now, and I'm not going to fornicate, and I'm not going to chase women. So I maybe, you know, it's not as bad if I just watch porn once in a while. And, you know, that once in a while became a lot more, yeah. became a lot more. Then it was just like, oh, well, I'm, I'm to the point where I don't even worry about fornication anymore with women. So I'm good with that, but I have to have my porn. So it's like trading one sin for another. And eventually it just began to feel gross. It be, I just I said, God, you got to help me get out of this. Listen, I'm going to tell you the truth. If you want to break away from pornography, you have to rely on the grace of God only. You cannot do it from your flesh. You cannot do it from your own willpower. But what you can do is you can get proactive and you can, you know, put guards on your phone. I mean, if it's that bad, like me, I didn't have to do all that. But some people, you have to put guards on your phone. You have to, you know, keep your laptop closed, you know, put it away when you're done using it. When you get the thought in your mind. Go work out, do some push-ups, go exercise, go take a shower, get your mind off of it and proactively fight 
and eventually the Holy Spirit will will begin to just to to like melt it off of you. I, I can't explain it. It's uh, it doesn't happen overnight, but it, it takes you know an effort on our part to work with the Holy Spirit to avoid uh, giving into it and and ev- like exercise, showers, eat some food, go out for a run, go sit outside, just change whatever you're doing, and and it gets better. And uh, yeah. if that's coming from somebody who was literally drowning in pornography for a couple of years and i was you know i'm ashamed of it but i'm not you know i'm not too ashamed to testify yeah. because there is victory in the grace of god and, and god has brought me through um i can't sit here and tell you that i that i may never stumble again i mean so far so good praise god i haven't but you know if it happens i know that i'm still a child of god but i gotta just i gotta continue to be proactive to fight against it yeah because for me I know it's slowly but sharing it's slowly going away, which I thank him for. The Holy Spirit is slowly is slowly um getting rid of it, and I'm I'm so glad. But yeah, I I, I have to um uh, I'm gonna have to uh, say good night to everybody because uh, I it's just sitting this long one for three hours is uh, too hard on my body. So I I I've had enough. I surrender, Natalie. Natalie, I surrender. <laughs> <laughs> you asked a I question about an hour ago. Before, Brother Luke, we love you, man. You're like yeah. OG. You're like OG Pop Pop. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'll, I'll say my good nights uh, to everybody. Um, um, it, another Fellowship Friday was a wonderful time with all of you. And I, I look forward to every Friday night with you. And uh, I mean, it's so wonderful. I mean, look, we have. Uh, Nairobi, Kenya. We have Ireland. We have all over the country. What a wonderful th- uh, gift we have here! This technology. So, England. oh, England. That, I'm that sorry. My girl Kel over in That's Australia. Right. My Aussie saucy. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just wonderful uh, this opportunity. I'm glad we're taking advantage of. Oh no! Just <laughs> as I'm saying good night, Lisa finally comes. I, I I can't leave just as she can. That would be too rude, Please Lisa. Sorry, yeah. brother Luke. I had trouble. I had to go shut my system down and reboot it and download some stuff yeah. just to get in. Hey, girl. I was just saying welcome, Lisa. I was just saying good night, but I, I'm not. I'm going to stay ten more minutes because now that you're here, now you got to stay, brother, brother Luke. Luke. You, could, you could take a break and just come back and. Uh, yeah, maybe I can, maybe I can. I'll just leave it on and come back a little bit, I guess. But I got to get up and move yeah. around and do something. So, uh, Lisa, so nice you could be here. I figured Praise you were going to be here. Possible. Yeah. yeah. I, Have you? Been, I, I you tried as fast as I could. Thing? I thought no, you might want to. No, I came in about it. halfway through. On the on the spiritual battle, I said Lisa wants to chime chime in on that. I'm sure. Oh yeah, when I heard you guys, you started talking about. Um, I think I came in right about the time that it was just before Sister Renee was talking about um, people thinking that when people have chemical imbalances, it's always the devil. And uh, it was a little bit before that that I came in. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll move around. I'll check back later and see if everybody's still here. Okay. Thank you, Brother Luke, for inviting me. Uh, yeah. Hello, everyone. Thank you for your salutations. Blessings in Jesus' name. Yes. Amen. Hey, God bless you. Thanks for joining. All right. Now, same to all of you. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, let's see, you guys were talking in the chat and I couldn't get in here fast enough. Literally, my computer locked up. I had to shut it down, reboot, download some stuff to get the uh, hangouts to work. So I think we're good now. But uh, Sister Renee was talking about, oh, no, you, you were talking about pornography. And I actually have a video on my channel where I talk about that, that pornography is witchcraft, sex magic. And a lot of believers, uh, the, one of the devil tricks is to make saints of God think that when they're involved in a sin, that is more about their sin. And they're not recognizing that this is a weapon that has been formed against you. Amen. And and the devil is coming to kill, steal, and destroy. So it's yeah. it's kind of like when you're fishing, 
and you put well, something on a hook and you throw out there what a devil throws it out there and he trying to reel people in and he yeah. doesn't know what you're going to like or what you're going to necessarily have an affinity for so he just keeps fishing and if he could take get you to take the bait then he's got you hooked and that's what it's all about and it's trying to reel you in to kill steal and destroy and if he can't literally physically take your life he's happy trying to destroy your marriage destroy your children he wants to get in there so he can develop a stronghold well and well. as jesus said in the bible you cannot spoil a man's goods unless you first bind the strong man yeah. and so he's trying to get a stronghold against you so he can spoil all your goods yeah. I'm walking out for just a few minutes. I got to take the dog out. I'm going to leave it open. Can, Luke or Dave, can you cover for me? Uh, okay. This yeah, we got it. it. Preach but, it, Lisa. But yeah, Better that's praise how the Lord. It is me. Can you hear me? So to the person that said, well, can you know you dabble in a little bit of porn? You know, that's just like saying, should I dabble in a little bit of witchcraft? That stuff is whole sale sold out for satan it is 100 percent satanic and demonic and you can start with something that seems benign but it's not and the devil is trying to work against you as a weapon with that mess because pornography when you get started with it it never stays where you started it's gonna sink lower and lower and lower and lower into further and further and further depravity. Uh, most of the people yeah. that get hooked on it when they when they tell you the truth, they started out with what they call straight heterosexual stuff, and then they go and after a while, whether it's weeks, months, or years, they get bored with it. It's not enough. So then the next thing comes along, and before you know it, they're looking at bondage or torture or animal stuff. It's just all this wickedness until the devil will try to pull you into something so deviant and detestable he'll he'll have you even questioning whether or not you're saved and it's all a trick because see if he can get you tied up in uh in some form of bondage like pornography you ain't winning souls you ain't praying you ain't fasting you ain't reading the word because he got you too busy being filthy about what you're doing Yeah, it's a trick. Of, it's a trick of the enemy. And you have to un look at it as a weapon where the devil is coming to destroy you. He wants to destroy your marriage. That's going to be one of the first things that he's going to attack, whether you're male or female, because your husband or your wife, when they discover that you're doing this, is going to feel emotionally uh, that you have committed uh, infidelity and adultery. And they're going to they're going to begin to feel why isn't why why aren't I enough for him or her? So now the devil's attacking them. Now you've also invited some spirits in your house that also the spirit doesn't stay with you. It's going to want to transfer itself to someone else. It wants to multiply. So if you have small children, it may begin to mess with them. Um. This is not a this this is supernatural. This is not something you want to play with. It is akin to literally going and getting a Ouija board or or starting to practice witchcraft. It's not something you want to play with, beloved. Anybody out there, don't let the devil trick you into thinking because you've done it or you're doing it that you're any more evil than anyone else. Rebuke that mess. Understand it's a weapon that's being formed against you. Make no occasion for the flesh. If you know you're weak, you know what your tendencies are to go do that, then you need to do the things that keep you from doing it. Um, there's one video I have way back on my channel from back when I first started where a pastor had gotten caught up into this stuff and he had to go get an accountability partner and he put software on his computer that would block him from going to any adult sites. And if he managed to slip it in somewhere, uh, his accountability partner would call him several times a week and straight ask him. And you had to remember you, when you finna lie, I'm full of the Holy spirit. You getting ready to lie to the Holy spirit. Don't lie to me about what you've done. Because lie is another form of witchcraft. 
You're deceiving someone and causing them to believe something that's not true. And once they believe it, you've cast a spell. So people, we got to understand it. As the Bible says, this is a spiritual battle. And the devil is coming. He's not, he plays for keeps. This is not a game for him. He has to keep believers ineffectual. So they're not praying. They're not fasting. They're not ministering the word. They're not winning souls. Because every soul you win, you're, you're destroying and attacking his kingdom. And you're bringing light into the darkness. And he wants to stop you. He knows he can't take your, your soul. So the only thing he can hope to do to a believer is bind them and keep them ineffectual. And you're playing right into his hand. And you know what? The longer you do that mess, you're never going to know who you were supposed to be in Christ. Because it is vanity and vexation of your spirit. And you are being limited as to the things of God. You're not moving and operating in his spirit. You're not offering uh, uh, help in, 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 in time of need for another believer because you're too busy uh, uh, soothing your flesh with that demonic activity. That's right. Yeah. And Absolutely. this is not a condemnation to anyone. Please don't take it as such. It's an admonishment to recognize that this is spiritual warfare and the devil is coming against you to take everything he can from you. Yep, absolutely. And what I can tell if he you can, if he can render you ineffective, then it's going to, not only is it going to ruin your witness, it's going to keep you uh, out of the, out of the great commission. It's going to keep you tied up in condemnation. It's going to keep you uh, just unfocused on, you know, just like she said, he can't have your soul. You've been purchased and bought by God. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit. But you can ruin your witness. You can literally lose focus. You can become ineffective, an ineffective servant. You can be uh, a hinder. It's a hindrance is what it is. And the more we feed into it, the, the, the heavier the chains get. And like she said, for some people that really, really, really struggle, there's software, there's programs. You can get on your computer, get an accountability partner. And in the long run, you'll see that you know, what a distraction it really can be. Yeah. Amen. It's a waste of time. And, and, it, and remember, the Bible says we're supposed to redeem the time because the days are evil. Are evil yeah. and we're, we're out here doing battle against the wicked one. And Satan knows he has but a little time. Every day that passes by, he draws closer to his judgment. So he, he's not playing the game. He's trying to drag as many people to hell as he can with him. And if you're one less believer that's out there being active for Christ, to witness Christ, to live for Christ, then that's one less pain he has to worry about. Because every time somebody gets born again, Satan trembles because he don't know if this is going to be one that's going to come against him with all the fury of the kingdom of heaven. And sadly, too many Christians have too much sympathy for the devil. You're not supposed to have any. He is your mortal and spiritual enemy. He is trying to destroy you, your loved ones, everything about you. He's going to come at you with everything he has. But the good news is Jesus said he has given us power over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt us. Yeah, we have to remember that. We have to meditate on that. You have to grow in the strength and the knowledge of that. And when you understand and you start looking at these things that the devil tries to ensnare you with as weapons that are formed against you, you can literally laugh at it. And Satan, I see your ploy. I see your trick. This is a joke. And in Jesus' name, I rebuke you. And the, the more times you do it, the easier it will get for you to walk away from that mess. Yep. And, if, and for me, slowly but surely, every time when I have a thought like this, or some, sometimes I say, the Lord rebuke you, and other times it gets to me. But I need, I should say that all the time, because <coughs> he knows, he knows that I'm, I'm well, slowly growing. Let and me give you some encouragement, Caleb. Proclaiming your righteousness in Christ, who he says you are. Hey, Here's I'm Here's a key that. tactic that a lot of a lot of believers sweep this under the rug, but this is our this is our our actual instruction 
against demonic oppression because as children of God, we don't have to worry about the devil possessing us. We just have to fight against him oppressing us. And this is a verse that nobody ever talks about in spiritual warfare, but it's the most powerful verse that I believe as a believer can use. And that is James 4, 7. We have to first submit ourselves unto God. We have to resist the devil and he'll flee from us. We The, the Bible teaches us to resist Satan. Doesn't tell us to go attacking him Thank or go you. looking for him. Doesn't tell us to go around looking for him, trying to pick fights with him. Yeah, he will come to us. To you. I just took him out. Yeah. What I'm saying is, is we when we learn to humbly submit ourselves unto God first, we we get the power from God to resist the enemy, and then he flees from us. We keep our armor on, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't engage in spiritual warfare if we need to, but we shouldn't go around looking for it. And uh, you oh, know, no, I'm, I'm not saying that, that either. The uh, somebody in the chat room was saying. I'm so tired of like the battling. The you know, a lot of the Pentecostals will run out and start calling that you know preaching against prince. They even go up in uh, airplanes to preach against the principalities and high. I'm not kidding. This is true. So, uh, like uh, Sister Lee said, Brother Dave, they're claiming the war is done. The war's won. The, the that's done. He uh, Jesus is he's. The devil is no match for God. He is under Jesus's feet. He's made him his footstool. But we have to know our authority is not our power. It's not our authority. It's it's God's. And the best way is to uh, uh, flee from him. Like Dave said, flee from him. We don't go looking for it. Uh, and sometimes when I, I feel attacked or I get thoughts that are repetitive or something, I'll swat it away like a fly. The Lord rebuke you. I'm the righteous of God in Christ. I know who I am. I know who my Savior is. I know my Savior lives. You know, I stand on no weapon formed against me shall prosper. And I, I try to stand on his promises and who he says we are. And some of this Pentecostal stuff that's going on lately with all this, uh, you know, I, I can't really explain it. Do you know what I'm talking about? Where they're going after the principalities and they're, you know, it, it just, to me, it's all craziness because the best way to defeat the devil is like Lisa said and, and Brother Dave said, is just to resist it, to not go there anyway, to know he's laying a trap for you. He, he already has atheists. He's not going out to destroy their lives. If he can't take your soul, he wants your victory. Because you can be a vessel of honor for God and bring other people to the truth of how good God is and what he's done for us. And if he can destroy that witness and that testimony and that victory and get you preoccupied with an addiction or a habit or to take your eyes off Jesus or to get you involved in a bunch of problems and drama in your life through adultery and stuff. And you focus on that instead of focus on serving the Lord. That's what he wants. And it is a trap. Like she said, he's, he's laying it so he can steal, kill, and destroy. And his weapon is what? Deception. Temptation and deception. Yeah, Amen. this is why no this is why no believer should ever oh, I'm, the I'm sorry, Caleb. No believer should what, honey? No believer should ever underestimate Satan because there's a whole lot of believers who did that and they ended up dead. But we also we don't overestimate him either. Absolutely. He's not omnipresent. He's not under every rock. God is still on the throne. Yep, absolutely. What, Natalie? What's up? Um, the sky. Oh, I thought, I thought you were saying something. No, I was, I was talking to my son. Oh, okay. <laughs> but yeah, what, what I'm hearing I right my now. Phone, this, yeah, I'm glad that I have fellowship with all of you because now growing in grace and it, what I'm dealing with right now, it is slowly going away, slowly but surely. But Lisa's right. I should not let this stuff overtake me. I should not give him any more power over me because I'm not even his anymore. Like, I'm still giving him power over me like I'm still his. And I'm like, yeah, this is going to eventually destroy me. I, my joy, I, my my joy is slowly coming back. I believe the Holy Spirit is bringing it back, and 
yeah, I should not be, I should not engage in this any longer. So thank you. Well, it's brother Caleb. It's all right. See, grace, grace is what'll wash you again and, and, and empower you to get back up. And it's, it's, it's literally what'll drive you away from it. If you'll just rest in it, don't beat yourself up if you fail, if you fall, but, but actively be proactive in, in, in trying to change your mind. Uh, you know, when the thoughts get in your head, put it on something else. Just, you just, you rest in God's power. You, you let God assist you in coming out of it, but you, Absolutely. you, you try to just be proactive. And if you fail, if you fall or stumble along the way, don't kill yourself over it. Look, a million failures. Grace showed up a million and one. I'm telling you, God sees your heart. He sees you want to come out of it. He'll work with you. He's patient. He's long suffering, but just be a little proactive and let great, let the grace of God pull you out of that because it's the only thing that'll really truly change us. Amen. Like Jesus Absolutely. said, clean first the inside of the cup. You know, you get clean when you trust him. He cleansed you from all unrighteousness and he will start to work on the outside. Yes. But like she said, don't don't fall into his trap because he does want to destroy us. And I, I wanted to mention one of the viewers uh, in the chat room was saying you know, some of this Pentecostal deliverance stuff is really unhealthy because it, it puts an unhealthy focus on Satan and devils. And, you know, it's like, what, no, keep your focus on Jesus. Yes, don't look absolutely. for a devil under every rock. Not everything is a spiritual oppression or warfare. Sometimes it's just the flesh. Don't give them that much power. Sometimes these are just things of the flesh in our fallen state. So don't don't make him bigger than he is. Have a healthy respect for what you're up against. Yes. But, but he's not, he's under the feet of Jesus. And we are in him. And he that's within us is greater than he that's in the world. Amen. We we should focus on Jesus all the time, not not constantly thinking the doubt like, oh, they make satanic hand signals and this and that. It's like stop looking for evil everywhere. Yeah. And, and, and there you go, Renee. I was just going to touch on that point and say that's very. I'm so glad you brought that up because sometimes if we concentrate and constantly look for the evil, we might get into this area in our mind where we're like. Oh, we need deliverance. We need deliverance. No, you really just need a little discipline. Yeah, I was just about to say that a, a lot of this, um, the things that we're dealing with, uh, what they accuse us about, about uh, being as being grace believers is that we're giving licenses to sin and all that yep. nonsense. Right. When in fact, um, when it, we're talking about salvation specifically as it relates to that, when, if you were to ask us about discipleship or when we start talking about that, that's the next level. We're not talking about salvation. Then we're, we're moving on from repentance of dead works and we're moving on to how to crucify the flesh and put these things asunder. You know, and and it, and it really comes to that too as well. Uh, the Bible says you're supposed to, if you're not married, you count those members as dead. You know, Paul had all the the, the men of God that weren't married; they would have to have dealt with that and and put that their flesh under subjection, and that's what you end up having to do. Uh, like she, like uh, I'm sorry, the brother that was talking about it uh, says, "God, Jesus, there." Uh, He's saying if you need to go take a cold shower Then you go take a cold shower You put your flesh under subjection But you're submitting to God when you do so If you need to stop and start praying And rebuking the devil then do so If you need to start telling your flesh Flesh you need to settle down in Jesus name I'm, I said no You know that kind of thing That starts moving into being a disciplined one that's what we were talking about earlier with the vessels of honor and the vessels of dishonor. We're all in the same house. We're all children of God by grace through faith alone. But if we want to go on to maturity and be vessels of honor, uh, we, we got to, it says we got to purge ourselves of certain things. And you know, that purging is not easy. It's painful. It's, it's not a, a quick process, but like I said, if we learn to rest in the grace of God and we, you know, we don't continually beat ourselves up when we stumble, but we just learn to rest in him, you know, get refreshed, get cleansed, get, you know, get alone with him and, and, and he'll, he'll lift us back up and we get a little stronger each time. It, it's, it's, it's amazing actually, when you stop trying to, do everything from your own willpower and your own mind. And you really just let the grace of God kind of push you along. It's, it's, it's amazing. 
It also says that Peter, if any man lack these things, and it lists all the fruits of the spirit, he has forgotten that his old sins were purged. Were purged, yeah. He's forgetting yeah, what Christ right. did for him. Forgetting who he is in Christ, right? Right, right. Amen. Yeah, it's tough, you know. And I'm, a, I'm gonna be real. I have a, you know, as a preacher, you know, a lot of people they they refuse to. Uh, you know, they refuse to invite me to come speak to their church because I know a lot of the people on the outside here in town. And, you know, being a Jersey guy, before I came to Christ, it was F this, F that, every other sentence. And, you know, even in my walk with the Lord and even in being in ministry, I have a tendency to go from zero to 100 pretty quick. I have a short fuse and, and I can, you know, drop an F-bomb here and there. And I don't do it, you know, I don't do it maliciously or purposely, just sometimes it's just by habit and I still have to have the Lord. I mean, thank God I never do it when I'm preaching, but I have to, I still have to have the Lord, you know, work on my mouth and work on my mind um, because it's hard, it's hard to get something so deeply rooted in you out. I mean, I went from F this, F that to every other sentence, you know, when I wasn't in Christ yep. to to occasionally it coming out of my mouth, like right. without thinking, but I'm still catching it and I'm still trying to, you know, hold my thoughts captive to Christ. I'm trying to give it to the Lord each time and it's getting better. And I see progression. I see real change happening and it's like effortless. It's all, it's all God. It's beautiful. Like Isaiah said, woe with me. I'm a man of unclean, unclean lips. lips. <laughs> right. And, uh, and uh, a nice. nice person was saying, thank you, Renee. I, I felt like I was too far gone, but I heard God's word. I don't care if you sign your soul over to Satan in a blood ritual. You said, yeah, right. Sister Renee. You gotta say it. Speak. Jesus is more powerful than a blood contract. The blood That's of right. Jesus, you are never too far. If there is life and breath in you, you are not too far gone. Christ will oh, always you. bring you to him. He will always receive you. He said, it is anyone that comes to me, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Anybody that comes down, you can never yeah, be right. far gone. I know a lot of people want to go, well, you can't be saved if you do this then. Or you, I blaspheme the Holy. You can't blaspheme the Holy Spirit if you got breath in you. If you go to your death refusing the witness the Holy Spirit gives you of Jesus, that's blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Amen. But, but as long as you are alive, it's not too late. It doesn't matter how far into sin you've gone. Christ paid for all of it. He endured that suffering, and it's a shame that he paid the sin debt of every person that ever lived and ever will live. And some, it'll be in vain for. It'll be in vain for those Amen. people because they just won't receive it. Uh, to the person that, that you guys were just speaking about um, that thought they maybe went too far and they had blasphemed the Holy Spirit, and, and, you know, you get this a lot. Uh, that, that's almost a verification. There's just no way you've done that because the person right. who would have stepped right. out there, their conscience is seared. They they will think they have done nothing wrong. They, you know, God don't need to talk to them. Everything's perfect. Yep. Or they have just totally shunned God. They've hardened their heart. They won't receive the knowledge, as it says in Romans 1. They don't even want to keep God in their that's knowledge. Right. Right? You're you're examining yourself and you're taking notice and you're saying, I, I think I've done these things that you have not committed blasphemy against the whole Holy Spirit because you would have thoroughly rejected him. That wouldn't even be a thought in your mind. Yep. That, uh, Richard Dawkins. I don't know if you heard this the other night, Lisa, but Richard Dawkins used to say, if there was evidence, then, yeah, I would believe in God. But now he says. Even if the stars spelled out, Richard, this is God, believe in me, or a booming voice from heaven, I would think, one, I'm either hallucinating, or two, aliens did it. So no evidence will be enough for him. That's a man. Now, that, that conscience is here. It's done. He hates God so much that no evidence will get him to believe in the God. That's of God. blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, a, heart, that a is, completely that hardened is heart. the witness that the Holy Spirit is bearing of Jesus. That's where, and he's rejected it over and over again. And that's why Jesus uh, told the Pharisees to stop saying that his miracles came from the devil because they're blaspheming the Holy Spirit by uh, rejecting the Holy Spirit's evidence of who he is. 
And yeah, if because, they continued to do that, it was going to be too late for them. If they, it wasn't yeah, a because in, event. It's not a one-time event. It's not like you can speak something once and that's blaspheming the Holy Right. It's hard. It's hard. It's continual hardening of the heart to where yeah. you end up completely rejecting the witness and the drawing to come that's to Christ. Right. That's right. The Holy and Spirit. And so, bearing like the witness. sister, the sister said, if you ask that question. That's a great sign you have not committed it. <laughs> that is absolutely true. But you know, there's that campaign where they encouraged, the, Rich, uh, Richard Dawkins did it with the God delusion, that uh, encouraged teenagers to say, I blast you in the Holy Spirit and I'm not scared. And they do it on camera. And now some of them are getting older and fearing that they've done it. But blast, it's not speaking. People think blasphemy because you speak. But it's not just speaking against him once or something like that. It's rejecting the witness of the Holy That's Spirit. Exactly. You just you just you just unlocked the key, Renee, that a lot of people don't understand. When Jesus said blasphemies against my father and blasphemies against me can be forgiven, he was talking about the, the, the speaking wise. Right. Cursing, using God's name in vain, uh you know, using their name in an ill manner. But when he when he transferred and started talking about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, he was talking about a whole nother subject. Yes, it's it's when God himself has his spirit bear witness to you, whether it be through a miracle or his word or a witness or whatever, and evidence after evidence is given to you of who Jesus is and what he's done for you, and you reject that unto your death, that is unforgivable. You will have your sins on your account. You will die in your sins. Yeah, and also um, for the person that was thinking they backslided too far, um, if you remember Jeremiah three fourteen, it says that uh, the Lord is married to the backslider, and that was in the old covenant. In the new covenant, you have a better covenant where uh, we can come boldly to the throne of grace, Hebrews four sixteen, and obtain help in time of need. There is no greater time of need than when you just sin. So you need to remember that you are in covenant relationship with King Jesus. And that he is literally only a prayer away. He dwells in you, okay, physically. But what you're missing and what you're feeling that you're missing when you, if you want to put feelings in there, okay, is the fellowship. Because sin gets between you and God. And it will pull you away from him if you let him, if you don't understand the relationship that you have and you continue on in sin because you're running from him because you go, well, I sinned and I did this sin and I did that sin and I did this sin. So now I'm even further away from God than I was even three days ago. Uh, that's a trick of the devil because all you have need to do is say Jesus and he's right there. So why, why would you allow the devil to talk you out of something you already have. See, that's a, that's a trick. You're not trying to get something. You have it. Uh, remember when the uh, when Jesus told the, the parable of the prodigal son? The prodigal son came to himself. Everything that he had when he came to himself and realized what he had, he had the day before and the day before and the day before when he was in folly. But once he got back in his right mind and recognized who his father was and that even his, the father's servants had more than what he was doing, thinking about pig slop and thinking about eating it. And he came to himself and he went back to his father. His father met him more than even halfway. He came running out to him and kissed him. So you have right relationship. Even if you're sinning, you are in relationship. But what you've done is you cut off, you cut off fellowship. So all you have to do is restore it. By getting back into it, start reading the word, start praying, start seeking God, uh, repenting daily if you need to change in your mind. That's all it means about what you're doing that's wrong. You, he says if you're drawn near to him, that's in the old covenant, he'll draw near to you. But in the new covenant, he dwells within you. So he's literally right there. And the devil is tricking people to think, oh, I got so much space between me and God. It's just not true. Your state is Absolutely not your standing. Not. Your state in Christ is not your standing. <coughs> See, uh, your physical body can have a problem. You can have a health problem, God forbid. And you don't feel like getting out of bed. You don't feel like doing anything. You don't feel like reading your Bible. You don't feel like praying. That's your flesh. And our flesh is, is, is fallible. 
it 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 it's um what what's the word I'm looking for is how how um delicate it is. There's a lot of things that can affect us where we wouldn't even be able to necessarily cry out to God. God forbid. But that doesn't change my standing in Christ. My state today may vacillate and tomorrow and the next day and the day after that. But my standing in Christ remains. I'm a born again believer in right relationship. And all I have to do is cry out to my father in the name of Jesus. And he's right there. Um, we got a question and I'm sure all you guys would answer the same. Uh, Mikey, he's our little buddy from Canada. I get texts from him often. He said, is asking Jesus into your heart to be saved biblical? No, of course not. The way no. he enters your heart is when you believe on him. When you trust what he did for you, then he does dwell in your heart. You don't have to ask Jesus, come into my heart, come into my heart. He automatically comes there when you put your trust in him. You can ask him all day long to come in your heart. He's not going to come to your heart if you don't believe on him. Right. That's the way he comes to dwell within you. The Holy Spirit dwells within you because you trusted in him. You believed that it, he gave you eternal life because of what he paid for you on the cross when, and when he died and rose again for you. So, yeah, asking Jesus in your heart is a false gospel. It's a false means of salvation. So it's submitting your life. You're not saved because you give your life to Christ. You're saved because you give his life for you. It's always yeah. got to be a focus on Jesus. Believing. You're saved by believing. You're receiving it. It is. It's all about believing. Yeah, that's it. That's all you can do. And, and it's terrible that they mock it. Easy believing. You're saved by believing. So easy or hard, it's believing. Mock it if you mock it if you want to. Period. That's how we're saved. And that's Preach. why they mock it because it's the foolishness of preaching. It pleased God to save them by the foolishness of preaching to them that believe. So yep. that's why it's Amen. foolishness that people mock it. It gets on my nerves when they call it easy believism. You know, like, they're, they're, they're angry. They're angry because, they're, oh, you think you can just believe and not work when I'm working for myself? I work so good. I quit this and I quit that. How dare you think you're safe? It's a bunch of nonsense. That's why yeah. they, they mock the gospel because they think they deserve salvation and they don't think other people should have it. It shouldn't be that easy because they did so much to get it. They're so faithful. It's so frustrating. Yep. Yeah. And the and the thing that they're doing now, the same thing they're going to do when they stand in front of him is boasting. Yep. But Lord, I quit drinking and I did this and I did that. And he never knew him because they, they, they mocked his power into salvation. Yep. If it's so easy, Amen. why can't they do it? Amen, abounding grace. If believing is so easy, it ain't that easy or they'd be able to do it. He's absolutely right. <laughs> oh, that was good. <laughs> right. <laughs> I tell, you know, I tell people it's it's not easy. And, and that's why Jesus says strive to enter. Because I'm going to tell you what, when you realize that the only way God's going to accept it is if you just receive it. It, you're you're gonna you're gonna strive to bring yourself to a point to where you can just receive it because every ounce of your being is gonna want to earn it, deserve it, work for it, and merit it because that's how we're wired. Yeah. That's why they mock it. That's right. And, you know, we are I, wired I, I, from we are wired from infants to yeah. Yeah. you know earn something, work hard for something. We're we're always constantly told. Uh, work harder, work smarter, be smarter, be greater, push, train, go, go. It's it's it, it's ingrained in us. So to simply just come to the end of yourself, put all your trust on something and, and receive something, it's it's very hard to do. I try to tell people, remember the Passover. Okay, Jesus is our Passover lamb. He's the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When the when death came over and was gonna kill all the firstborn throughout Egypt. The people, uh, the Israel was told to put blood, the blood of the lamb on the, on the outside of the door, right? Yeah. Why did death pass over those houses? Because, because they were under the blood. The spirit of death saw the blood and passed over them. It's and they, and they God. trusted, they trusted if, the instruction. If we are, if we are covered by the blood, the second death passes over us. We never yep. second death has no power. 
That is the salvation. It, you, like, the blood is what makes you lost or saved, period. That's yep. it. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. People people can't get this. They, they can't. It really is that. That is it. That was offered to God, the Father, by the Son on our behalf. We got nothing to do with it. We are a beneficiary of their covenant. He paid the debt. I, I, it's so many rejected, and the good news of the gospel has been lost. It it's right there in the book of Genesis, right after the fall, uh, when the Lord came down and asked them what they had done, and after they got through passing the buck and stuff, then he he killed the uh, the animal and clothed them with the skins, and they went free. They went away free. Amen. Right there, it's right there in the book of Genesis. Yeah. They yeah. Went what they try to do, girl? They tried to cover their sin with works with and their fig leaves. That's right, girl. That's right. And it. God is not accepting your fig leaf religion of works. Oh uh, no, it's not gonna cover Period. your sin. Period. And it's astonishing me. It's astonishing to me that Jesus said all you had to be was like a little child. Amen. And, and they want to complicate it. Uh, how, how complicated it is when a little child, you can explain the gospel to them. And they're just, do you, I remember when I was a child and I'd read the Bible and I see that. And I just, I knew, I believed that Jesus was the son of God and that he had died on Calvary for my sin. When I read it, I said, I believe it. Look at all the miracles he had done. And that's exactly what Jesus said. He said, if you don't believe me, believe the works. The miracles testify who I am. Yep. And I saw hey, that guys. as a child in the scripture. Oh, said, my gosh. Hey, you guys. Oh, my gosh. Do you remember wanna... earlier somebody was posting First John a lot? And I kept saying it's about fellowship. This is not saying here's your test to prove if you're really saved. Because if you sin, you're of the devil. You know, and I was like, no, this is about <laughs> fellowship, right? It's so funny. I just got this magazine from a, a grace ministry. And it's saying there's two views of First John. One is that it's a test to prove you're saved. But what we believe is that it's a test of fellowship. Are you walking in your faith? And that's wow. what I believe. Yeah. So I'm going to read this to you guys in one of my videos soon. Oh, and some black and white puppy decided to chew on it. Yeah, he was trying to eat it. Thanks for saving it for me, Jim. That, that little pit bull lab dog we got, he's trying to eat all everything. He tried to eat his Air Jordans earlier. Oh, show them, show them. Wow. Look at this. Look at this. I just I just came across randomly. I was reading through Ecclesiastes. Um, I had my Bible open to Ecclesiastes chapter three. And I just looked down at this verse and I swear this this just screams out eternal security to me. In Ecclesiastes three fourteen, it says, I know that whatsoever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything can be taken from it. And God doeth it. That's awesome. When, awesome. See, when, when God says to whom he begins a good work in, he's faithful and just to complete it. He's not saying that, that in this lifetime, in the flesh, that you're going to reach perfection. I mean, you can, you can go on to like a high level of spiritual maturity where sin is like really like you're. I'm not saying you can be sinless. No way. But you can sin less as you grow in grace and the spirit. But what God is saying when he completes this work in you is meaning that he has taken possession of your spirit and purchased you, put a down payment or a deposit, the sealing of his Holy Spirit in you. You're now bought with a price. You belong to him. And if he says he's going to finish the work he started, that means whether you go kicking and screaming or whether you go willingly obedient. <laughs> Oh, he, he's to going to off. save you. Here. Can you see him? Can you see him? He wants everybody to see you. <laughs> there he is. Okay. Sorry about that. I'm so sorry. That dog is too cute. Go ahead, bro. I'm so sorry about oh, that. Oh, he's a puppy, by the way. That dog is cute. No, I was just saying, I just read in Ecclesiastes 3. Out of my Bible was open to it. And it just it's just right there. It just says whatever. It says, oh. Uh, I guess Solomon was was speaking on behalf of God. He just says, I know that whatever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing yeah. can be nothing can be put to it and nothing can be taken from it. And God is the one that does it. 
There's lots yeah, of eternal there. security in the Psalms too. Yeah, yes. especially Psalms 89. I love, yeah, I love the Lord is up in the Old Testament like that. Once the Lord establishes a thing, it remains established. So <laughs> what He yeah. established. <laughs> And yep. God is not going to give Jesus because we're given to Jesus. He's not going to give us to Jesus knowing he'll lose us. I mean, that's just silly. And here's the, here's the thing I don't yeah. understand. In, in, in one breath, in one breath, they say Jesus died for your sins. But in the next breath, they say that you, the, the sins you commit are, are, are still held against you. Like, I know. Did, did Jesus die for our sins or not? Let's just right. establish, let's establish a point really quick. Did Jesus oh, die for our past. sins? It's only the past, don't you know? From the moment <laughs> you believe. So isn't it better for to believe until you almost die so all your sins are covered? Right. Well, you got a little bit ahead of me, Renee, but that's where I was going. Because when you really pin them down and you and you say, hold up, hold up, just, just stop. Because a lot of people, they just parrot like a parrot. You know, a parrot hears you say cookie and it's like, rah, cookie. You know what I mean? It's just, it just parrots what it they hears. So a lot of people will just start throwing out, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? And I'm like, wait, slow down, slow down, slow down. Let's, let's establish one point. Did Jesus Christ die for your sins? Yes or no. And they say, well, yeah, but, 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 or, or, or what about this? What? And I'm like, slow down. Let's try it again. Did Jesus die for your sins? Yes or no. You finally get them to slow down. You finally get them to think about it. And then you ask them a simple question. If Jesus died for my sins, how can my sins send me to hell? And it, it, they don't, they, it just, it just, it's, it's like they look at you like a deer in headlights. They have no idea how to explain that because they yeah. have not, nobody's taught them how to come to an understanding of what actually happens when you are born again, what Jesus actually uh, finished on the cross. What you know, they don't understand atonement, they don't understand justification, nope. they don't understand reconciliation, and this is why, this is why, because they don't have the understanding of those things, this is why they can't, in one breath, they can say, Yeah, Jesus died for my sins, but in the next breath, they can say, But my sins will send me to hell. Yeah, doesn't make that sense, makes me crazy, it makes me crazy when they do that. Yeah, so, they, Billy, don't, they don't believe. Uh, Jesus at all. It's like it's spiritual blindness. You can show them right in the scripture uh, exactly what the Lord has said and they'll still say but what about, but what about, what how are you going to contradict the living God? I, I've <laughs> never understood that. Like Jesus said, okay, let me see what you think about this. He never uh, no. He, when he said something, it's established. In fact, it says so in the book of Hebrews where it says uh, in chapter one, verse one, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. And people don't listen to his instruction. Um, when, when he straight said, all you had to do is believe in he who believed in him was not condemned, but not. he who believe it not is condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. Or how about it's when he right makes it so there. simple in John six forty seven? verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever believes on me has everlasting life. They're like, that's too easy. I can't believe <laughs> Or when he declared from the cross to telestai paid in full. Yeah, oh, they, they definitely don't believe that. They just say it's only past debt. It, they believe that Jesus brings you to the starting line but, and you got to finish it no yourself. Sense. That makes no sense. You know what? Because when he was crucified, all of our sins were future, Thank including you. the ones we haven't committed yet. So exactly. you either yeah. believe that or you don't believe he paid for anything. Thank you. She just said it. Are they believing on Christ, really? Are they believing God's report of his son? Are they trusting? Are they believing on him and they shall be saved? No, they're not. They're not believing on him for salvation. They think he's necessary for salvation, but that's just a part of it. Him himself is not sufficient for salvation. It's him plus your righteousness. That's what the majority of Christianity believes. And Hold on, false. sis. We got a we got a, a nine one one timeout emergency question in Go the ahead. comments. Young Young Dynamics um, is saying that because he's struggling with doubt, he 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 says he believes he knows Jesus paid it all, 
but he's he personally is struggling with doubt and confusion and he's worried about so many things. So he's literally wrestling with is he really saved or not? Okay. All I can say is so this. What do you think? Either Jesus paid our sin debt and he is savior and he accomplished what he came to do. The father's will is to save us from our sins. Remember, he's going to save his people from his sins, from their sins. He's going to, he's going to take away Jacob's iniquity. That's Israel's iniquity, right? That there's many verses about being clothed in his righteousness. Either he came and paid the debt that man couldn't pay or he did not. And if what he did wasn't enough, then why are there so many verses that say to believe on him, to believe in him, to trust in him, that we become his children when we take God at his word, that what his son did for us gave us eternal life. And if our righteousness isn't good enough, then how can it be good enough to be part of what saves you? Right. And, you know, Dynamics is a young, he's a young guy. I'm pretty 13. sure he's, he's probably a young teenager, maybe young adult. He's not uh, very uh, old. So well, and, and that's that doesn't make a difference, but but in a younger person, especially in a teenager, there's a lot of pressure in the world these days. They 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 may kind of understand it, but you know, I'm gonna tell you like this, dynamics. Uh, I know you're a young guy. I can I've just I just already figured you're a young guy. If you're not a young guy, then correct me. Um but I you know, you kind of get the gist of it. I've seen you in the comments on, on Sister Renee's videos. Hang in there, stick with it. Just remember one promise that God made. And God said, if you knock, the door shall be opened unto you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you some good encouragement, bro. I can't save you. Nobody here can save you. Only you can do it. But I'll give yes. you the advice. Start knocking on the door. Even yep. if you don't know what you're saying, even if you don't understand what you're asking, open up to God, turn to God, and be real with God and say, God, I want to be saved. I want to know Jesus. I want to know the truth. And, and I want to live and, and do whatever it is you created me to do. And I'm going to put my trust in you. Even if you're not fully understanding what you're doing, just seek and keep knocking. God promised that if you, something. yeah, yep. if you I knock know. on that door, God will open it. Let me read yep. Romans 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So because of what he did, we have peace with God now. By whom also we have access by faith into the grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope. Oh, of that's why he's confused. He's, he's 13, guys. He's 13. and But, right, you know, I'm, well, let me give you, let me tell him something really finish, quickly, Dave. sis. Let me finish he, this. He needs to understand. Okay, that yeah, yeah, one exactly. Man's, one man's disobedience made him condemned. And so only another man could make him uncondemned. Right. That man had to be the perfect man. And he was the second Adam and his name was Jesus Christ. You are lost and dead in your sin because of Adam's disobedience. So the second Adam had to come and be obedient for you because God's justice had to be served. His, his law had to be fulfilled. And Jesus is the only one, as God manifests in the flesh, that could fulfill that law. You could not. None of us could. So here we go. But not as the offense, but also also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, has abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one, Adam, to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification, which means you're declared righteous. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more they which receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. If everybody is condemned to the second death. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men under justification of life. So, for as the one man's disobedience, many were made censors, sin sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. 
So you're not righteous because of what you do. What? Because the second Adam did. Jesus did. See, this has nothing to do with you. And that's what we have. We have faith in the obedience of Jesus, that he lived the perfect life and paid our sin debt. Because you you were already born dead in your sin. You were on your way to hell and you had nothing to do with it. And so just like you got nothing to do with getting to heaven. The second Adam, the first Adam made you lost and made you dead spiritually. And the second Adam came and made you alive and gave you eternal life. None of that had anything to do with your performance. It's all Jesus' performance and his obedience. I'm sorry. I want to make sure I tell that. Part. No, that was perfect. That's what I was going to go. Yep. You hit it. That's it. Uh, and, and, and he's having trouble understanding because he's 13. But he, he, he understands that you can't work for it. Lie, Chad. Go ahead. Yeah. Who's that, Caleb? Yeah. All I can say is from teenager to teenager, don't, don't let this doubt overtake you because I did – when I was watching these hell testimonies, I let doubt overtake me. And now, since I now know the real truth, I, I don't have doubt anymore. So if you are saved and you have doubt, I'll just don't let this doubt over consume you and also rebuke it. Say it, say unto this doubt, the Lord rebuke you. And if any evil spirit is whispering in your ear, torment or pressing you saying that you're not saved or whatever rebuke them say unto them the lord rebuke you i know who i am he knows who i am and you can do nothing about it even if you try and plant doubts in my mind in the name of the lord jesus christ the lord rebuke you and that's hey, all i have to say you guys uh it's 1 a.m here and uh I, i'm gonna have to get to bed what does uh, james 14 to 26 mean faith without which works chapter, is dead. Which chapter? Uh, James um, 14 to 26. It James says, works without faith without works is dead. Let me uh, are explain you talking that about to James you. 1 or James 2 14? James 2, sis. All right, it says, What is it, my it's, brother? But here, but here, faith. I want you, sister Natalie, I want you to yes. listen carefully. This yeah. is the con this is the context. Okay, you ready? I'm gonna break this down and I'm gonna try to do it in less than two minutes. So try to just okay. follow along with me, okay? Yeah. First of all, James is talking to believers. He's talking to people who are already saved. Okay. I want you to take a little pencil or a pen and I want you to write down Romans chapter four, verses one through five. Okay. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna quickly do a contrast here and try to follow along. What? Romans yeah. chapter four. Verses one through five. You should watch okay. my video on James. It explains everything. Chapter verse. what? Sorry. Chapter four. Chapter um, four. Verse Quattro. what? Verses one through five. Yeah. Okay. Um, now try to try to follow along. I'm gonna try to do this in like sixty seconds. Okay. Yeah. James. James is talking to already saved believers. Paul in Romans four is talking to already saved believers. What the difference is. Is James is explaining the faith believers ha uh, should have before mankind. Paul is explaining the faith that justifies us and saves us before God. Okay, if you want to see the context of James 2, it says, For it says, uh, What doeth it profit? What do it profit? Notice the word profit, okay, and I'm going to tell you why. For what do it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can his faith save him? Now, here's the, here's the context. Verse 15. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says unto them, depart in peace, be warmed, be filled. Basically, if you see people in need and you're a professing believer and you turn them away, what good is your faith going to be to them if you're not actually showing them your faith by serving them, helping them? But notice that it says, what does it profit? James is talking about good works that, that we are already believers to show our faith before man. And if you look at Titus chapter 3, verse 8, it says that those of us who name the name of the Lord, let us be careful to maintain good works. Why? Because they are profitable unto men. Yeah, and it's not talking about, it says, can faith save him? It's not talking about from hell. It's talking about, can your faith actually assist somebody in need if you turn right. away from them? Right. If you shun them away, it's, it's not going to provide uh, <coughs> if somebody is uh, 
is in need physically. Yes, For James two is right not a salvific. Right. It's not even a salvific passage yeah, at all. It's not even about being saved from hell. It's also talking about the the temporal chastisement that comes and the judgment of men. Yes, the judgment of others. Uh, upon and, you, us. and you can prove you can prove that James talking to the already saved brethren is an an an, an a, uh, admonishment or exhortation of us as children of God to serve and do right by others. But it, you yeah. can prove that it's a, uh, um, talking about works before mankind, a faith that works before mankind. And then Paul is proving the faith toward God because in Romans four, it says Abraham believed God and it was counted yeah. for righteousness. It says that Abraham was not justified by his works, but by yep. his faith. And he was so, saved while yet in uncircumcision before he faith, did work at all. Faith to be saved before God is is faith tr and trust in God. And then when we become children of God, to show our faith to others, we love and serve them. It's that simple. It, yeah. the people, people use James 2 and they make it so difficult. The Catholic Church is based on James. A misunderstanding of what James means. They ignore all the verses that were saved by believing on Christ and then take James at that one little section and put their whole false salvific message on it uh James is about spiritual maturity yeah and bringing people who are already saved into a deeper understanding about how we're to conduct ourselves as believers That's so right. you don't stay stagnant so you don't stay in the same place okay i'm saved now what and how can we show i mean how can they see christ in us if we're not showing our love there it is to others they can't they can't right. see god in us if, if we're I mean, if we're not going to be providing and being charitable and loving people who will if the church isn't doing it who will but you guys i have to go it's after 1 a.m and uh jim's got to get to sleep and everything and uh, I, sister I renee. Sure. hey sister renee home. let uh sister renee let brother billy uh take us out in prayer real quick oh you got it you go ahead brother billy mm. Can we hear you? He's muted. Oh, you yeah, unmute, Billy. All right. So, for today, um, I remember the question about, you know, someone was afraid that what you guys teach, the grace you are teaching, will lead to more sinning. Yeah, and this is something the Bible directly contradicts. Like if you look at Titus two, eleven, twelve, thirteen. It says that, you know, what, the question is, what teaches us to say no to sin? Yeah? And the answer is the grace of God. It teaches us to live upright lives in this crazy world. Yeah? It actually says the grace of God teaches us to live righteously in this world we, we currently are. And also um, Romans 6.14. Yeah? Romans 6.14 says that um, for if... You are not under the law, yeah? You you can be above heck. What the heck does it say? Romans 6.14. Right, you're no, you're no longer under the law, but under grace. Yeah, so sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but you are under grace, yeah? And so mm -hmm. I normally tell guys, like, read it the opposite way too, yeah? If If you are under the law, put yourself under the law, then certainly um, sin shall have dominion over you, right? And this is something also um, Brother Luke said some time back um, about people who take specific small verses like um, the ones in John and say, hey, you see, this is against um, one saved, always saved, yeah? You see, the fact is there are few Bible verses that are obscure. It's not clear, but the majority are for one saved, always saved. Yeah, um, we see it in Romans eight. You know, nothing can separate us from His love. We see it in John ten. Um, he says, um, "Nothing can snatch us out of His hand." Yeah, and um, someone read earlier and said, um, "We who believe will not be judged, will not be condemned." So. 
Those are clear verses, even Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Yeah, clear verses. If it's by grace that you're saved, it's not by work so anyone can boast, right? These are clear verses. Stick to those. Stop looking at small lines that are probably taken out of context and then um, try and make your theology out of that. Like the whole, the whole of the New Testament is what you guys always preach, yeah? What Jesus has done. And when, if you rest on that, you are good. If you reject that, now that's blasphemy of the Spirit, yeah? What's you are God's right. name? Yeah. What's God's and name? So, Does anybody know what God's name is? Uh, why, honey? What's God's name? Uh, like, what did Jesus say it is? I don't know. You know, because of... Okay, it's in the Bible. I mean, if Jesus you want, Yudhe came, Vahe spells Yahweh, but that, that's the name no. of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But Jesus Christ mm -hmm. is God himself. Yes, but Jesus also told us to cry, Abba, Father. Our Father and when the yeah. disciples came and they asked him, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. He did not say Yahweh. That's he right. did not he say Jehovah. He did not say Elohim. He did not say Adonai. He said, Our Father. That's right. You are absolutely right. So and I don't, I don't even worry about what his just official name. He's got many names. El Shaddai, uh, Jehovah Jireh, Yahweh. It, Jesus Christ, Father, Son, but He's our Father, like Lisa said. He's our Father in heaven. That that's who God is. To us. So we just call Him Father, then. Yes. Yeah, the oh, Almighty yes. Father. That's it. Yeah, I don't. I, this whole sacred name business is getting out of control. I think. Well, you got to really be really is. careful with that because there were some things that were done uh, where the Masoretes inserted some stuff in the, in the old text, and we have to be really careful because the spirit of Antichrist. Anti doesn't just mean against. Everybody always thinks it means against. In it means in of. place of. That's right. So they are substituting names. To have people call on the names that Jesus never used well, once. You know what happened in the Old Testament with Baal? Baal just means Lord. And instead of using God's name, which was given to the Jews, they they were so scared to say his name that they wouldn't. They wouldn't tell his name to anyone. And God rebuked them for that. And they, they started calling him Baal which is a generic word for Lord, but Baal is a demon. Yeah, that's why I said it, you can't go wrong doing what Jesus did. And Jesus said to call on the Father or Abba, Father. So if you do that, you'll be all right. I agree. But if yeah. she's just asking what his name written, it's yud hey vav -Hey. That's how it's spelled in the Old Testament. But I don't call him by that. I've always called him Father and, and Jesus. Yeah, I, yeah. When I pray, I always say Almighty Father. I always say that. Yep, I say Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus. That's how I do Amen. every prayer. Yeah. But I talk to Jesus yes. all day. Sometimes I just directly talk to him. I don't think. Hey, that's sis. Possible. Real quick to the sister's point about Antichrist. I'm so glad she brought that up. Listen, I just want to. Real quickly, just touch on a few things to like kind of give you guys some understanding on that. It, Antichrist doesn't always mean against. In um what we see in Christianity and the great falling away and the deception that's upon us is, is in replacement of you, yeah. you have all these movements, these spiritual thing, all these teachings blending in with Christianity. They're going to try because you have to understand when the antichrist comes, whether we're here or not raptured or not, he's going to want to be exalted as God, worshiped as God, accepted as God. And I think Jesus gave us a hint on that when he said the wheat grow amongst the tares but you will not know the difference until the harvest. Or he says they come uh, as dressed as sheep, but inwardly, because look, they're not coming. You know, a false prophet isn't going to say, hey, I'm a false prophet. Uh, you know, a, a, a strange doctrine is not going to come in and say, hey, we're strange doctrine. They're going to come in looking like the real thing, trying to replace. And, and so Satan, as the Antichrist, is going to try to replace the Jesus Christ of the Bible. And that's why the deception is going to be so strong in the end times. Um, he says that in Matthew 24 and 3, doesn't it? Right, but, but my point is the sister made a beautiful point because everybody thinks that Antichrist means against. Yes, the spirit of Antichrist is against the spirit of God. A absolutely. 
but the Antichrist is also in replace of, and I'm so glad she said that because a lot of people don't think about this, and, and it gives us illustration to false teachers, false prophets who what? Yep. Walk like us, talk like us, act like us. They're in our churches. Uh, the wheats and the tares, they they grow together. They, you can't tell the, you know, it's hard to tell the difference because it's not coming in direct opposition. It's coming in as a replacement, and that's why you have to yeah. know the real thing. And that's a and to think about it, throughout the many years, there were many antichrists trying to replace God. The Pope calls himself the vicar, which means replacement for God. So he's an antichrist. There, a fallen angel claims to be Jesus Christ, trying to be the vicar. But we know that he is not. What's really this crazy? Like, there's a crazy man who thinks he's Jesus. Is it their fault if they're crazy? Mm-hmm. This is a, uh, actually, that verse is, uh, many shall come in my name and say, I am Christ and deceive many. So they're going to admit he's Christ, but they're going to yeah. prove something different. They're going to yep. prove wrong. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean they're going to say, hi, I'm Christ. Hi, I'm Christ. People think they're, you're nuts. But it's, uh, many will come in my name and say, I am Christ. So they're going to admit yeah. he's the Christ, but they'll teach something different. Yeah, to be a different Christ, and then right. and it starts with a lot of these false names, these substitute names that people are coming up with. They can't even agree on, and God is not the yeah. author of what confusion. What is it now that got Yahuwah, Yahushua? Yeah, yeah. It's well, like Yeshua, Yeshua means may His name and memory be obliterated. See, oh, people don't you know take. Oh yes, it's a curse against Jesus. But but and it comes, in Hebrews, God is my salvation. But I don't even yeah, call but, him that. I call no. him Jesus. Yeah, yeah, but Yeshua means too. may his name and memory be obliterated. It was a trick upon us by the same spirit of people that hate the Lord Jesus Christ. They gave us a fake name and people run into it. And you don't mm -hmm. wonder why you don't have no power and no no uh, anointing in your life. You're using these fake and false names. Well, you know what Sick, it is. What, what? They're putting faith in how you pronounce it. That's witchcraft. And yeah. that's exactly. Yeah. And, that, and that's why we had we need to leave those things alone, like beloved. It is the spirit of Every, antichrist. Yeah, it Every, doesn't matter what language we say his name in. No, Jesus and and Christ. here's the problem: people didn't know it meant that because you don't speak that language. That's why. You, so you didn't know that's what it meant. That's, that's why you're right. supposed to say it in your language. That's so you didn't know what it right. means. That's so, right. Like when More I say, people call out Jesus anyway than that other name. What you mentioned, I can't remember what it was. You it's or whatever. The spirit behind the name. Not how you pronounce the name. Yep. God knows yeah. our hearts. He knows yeah. that we're trusting Yahshua, Jesus, Emmanuel, the Son of God, the Living Word. He knows we don't have to say it in another language. It doesn't. It's not right. sacred names. That's witchcraft, where you have to pronounce things perfectly and summon things. There's a good, that's not good, a uh, good question in the comments by Ray Meha. He said, "If we're saved by Jesus alone, which I believe." Then why do we need experiential sanctification? I don't find it. You don't Brother Ray. have to have it, but it's God's will that all his children grow so that they can be servants. And plus, he does reward people for faithfulness. He does. It's a reward. And I want my eternal, I want to look him in the eye and go, I did my best. I did my best for you. Right. Yeah. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ alone took, took care of our sins. He justified us and sanctified us eternally in the spirit once for all. But now we realize who we are in him and we grow in, in practical sanctification so that we can be used by God, a good witness for God, uh, store up treasures in heaven, earn rewards at the judgment seat. There are things you don't have to be those things or do those things. But your 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 intimacy and your relationship with God is going is gonna to suffer. You don't you, want to you, follow Jesus's example. He was an example to all his children. That I mean, that's what experiential sanctification is. It's growing more, even in our fallen flesh, um, manifesting the truth uh, of what he's taught us through his love and grace. To be you know, just and loving and 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 uh, you know, and, and and the law is based on love. If you love someone, you're not going to take their husband. If you love someone, you're not going to steal their thing. You love someone, you're not going to lie to them or bear false witness against them. And I think it, it prepares us a little bit because the Bible says, even though we are not yet like he is, when he returns, we shall be like him. Right. We kind of get we kind of get like a precursor or a pre-taste of being in glory. Because, look, when we get to heaven, 
if you think, you know, if you, if you think, when we get to heaven, there's not going to be any sin, any lust, any wickedness. There's not going to be any of that stuff. So why not, why not try to, you know, allow those things to, to grow in your life now so you kind of get like a little, you know, precursor to what, what our eternity is going to be like. Because if you really just want to like wallow in sin for the rest of your life, you probably don't want to be in heaven. <laughs> right. Right. I, I don't. Yeah, exactly. You're going to be doing that. It's not compulsory, but it's God's will. I, I want to do God's will. I mean, you don't have to do anything. But but uh, what, once uh, the Holy Spirit lives within us, why would you want to grieve? Why wouldn't you want to grow? You get more peace that way. So it's up to you. You don't have to do a thing. Well, but, I don't know why anybody would want to go through the difficulty of being a believer and not have any rewards when they get to heaven. Yeah, right. that, yeah that doesn't make sense to me either. But it's almost one thirty, you guys. I got to roll. All right. I love you all very much. Okay. Thank awesome you. time tonight. God bless each and every one God of you on the panel. You. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. I really appreciate you guys. And I, I learn a lot from everybody's um, perspectives. And I just want to thank everybody in the chat for coming. Um, I, you know, tonight I, I, I heard a lot of good stuff, learned a lot of good stuff. And, and I just appreciate it. And Lisa, thank you so much for your godly wisdom, sister. Oh, please. You know what, y'all? Praise the Lord Jesus, okay? Because I wouldn't have known if it, it wasn't for the Holy Spirit and getting my hard knocks just going through life in the faith. And then the last thing I wanted to say real quickly is when you guys realize when the when the devil comes to tempt and test and try you, you know what ends up happening when you win the victory in an area, it proves to you who you are. It's like a confidence under your belt and you, you just go on to the next thing. You know, so don't yes. be discouraged if you get if you get tempted. Don't be discouraged. It's actually a blessing for you to get an opportunity to send that buzzard packing Amen. in Jesus name. Amen. Period. Always good to see you, Billy. Thank you. And Caleb, it was good to hear more from you tonight. Natalie, thanks for joining us. I know it's late over there or early now. And yeah. uh, Dave, thank you as always. Thank you. God bless Bye. you, Sister Renee. God bless you, panel. Love you in Jesus' God bless you guys. Take care and have a good evening.